So my parents divorced when I was seven years old. I have an older brother who was nine at the time of the divorce and my mum got full custody of us and we would only see our dad every other weekend. My mum was a waitress so she didn't have a, a steady income and we struggled a lot. And because of that, we moved around a lot because we were constantly being evicted from our homes. When I was about 10 years old, we settled down in a home in a not so great part of town. Despite this, this was the biggest and nice house that we had ever had. It was also really cheap compared to the other places that we stayed in the years prior. But there were always uh, creepy things that happened in this house. For instance, our, our TV in the living room would just turn on and off by itself. One night, in fact, uh, my brother and I were laying on the couch in our living room just trying to go to sleep. This wasn't uncommon for us as we slept in there many nights throughout our time there. And our TV came on as we were dozing off. Angrily, I got up and unplugged the TV from the wall and sleepily crawled back into our couch. A little while later, I could hear the faint static of the TV turning back on. I got up and went to unplug the TV, forgetting that I'd already done this previously, and when I realized, I freaked out and pressed the power button on the TV to get it to turn back off. And after that, I, I didn't sleep much that night. A few months passed by, and I'm laying in my bed this time. I'm not really trying to sleep, I'm just kind of laying there, and it was really quiet in my room when, out of nowhere, I heard a tap on my window. It was like a tap that you'd make with the pad of your finger, not your fingernail. I jumped off my bed and ran as fast as I could to my brother's room, which was right next to mine, and I turned on his bedroom light and was hysterically trying to explain to him what had happened in my bedroom seconds prior. I was begging him to let me sleep in the room with him because I was afraid to be alone at this point. He agreed and I got into his bed and after a few moments of laying there, we heard the same two taps on his window. Well, without saying a word, we both jumped out of bed and ran into our mum's room. We were crying and telling her what had just happened and she had been asleep and was irritated that we woke her up. She groaned and told us that we were probably just hearing things and that we needed to go back to bed. But as soon as she finished her sentence, someone tapped on her window the exact same way that they had done to my brother and I. My mum obviously shot up at this and told us that we could sleep with her that night. But somehow, we all managed to get to sleep that night with no further disturbances, but it was creepy. Another thing that happened was during the summer when my brother and I were at school. My mum worked every day from around 8 to 3 p.m., so she would leave us at home with her boyfriend at the time. He was a nice guy, but he didn't really do much. He just stayed awake all night and slept all day long. It was early in the morning and my brother and I were playing hide and seek tag. This is pretty much just um, hide and seek, but when you find the person, you have to tag them before it was their turn. We made sure to be as quiet as possible, so as we didn't wake my mum's boyfriend. I was the seeker and I found my brother, but before I could tag him, he just jumped up and ran outside. I chased after him and shut the door behind me and after a quick loop around the house, my brother went back inside. He stopped at the door and I tagged him and laughed out, you're it. He looked at me confused and I asked, what's wrong? He looked at me and said, the door's locked. I thought that he was crazy and I went to open the door and sure enough it was locked. But it wasn't locked by the knob, the deadbolt was locked. Something that could only be done from the inside. We ran to my mum's bedroom and banged on the window trying to wake up her boyfriend. He was a heavy sleeper and actually never woke up to let us in. Hours pass and my mum comes home and lets us into the house. My mum had also told me that there were some nights that she was sleeping in bed and she would hear my brother screaming his lungs out for her as he had just seen something terrifying. My mum would jump up and run into his room, only to realise that we were at our dad's house for the weekend. She said that this happened to her multiple times too. One night at around 3am, we were all in our bedrooms just sleeping soundly, but we were woken up by a loud crash in our storage room. We all slowly tiptoed out of our rooms to find all of our Christmas ornaments broken on the floor. 
We had been staying here for over six months by this point, and our storage tubs were stacked neatly in our storage room. We also didn't have a cat or any other animal that could have knocked them over. We also had carpet, not hard wood, so all of the ornaments being shattered seemed just really unusual. Well, we cleaned up the broken pieces and we just went back to bed. The last thing that happened in that house before we moved out was actually while we were on vacation. My mum had a friend who let us stay over while we were gone for a week. He didn't have a house of his own and he sort of just hopped from couch to couch, so this would only make sense for him to stay over. About halfway through the week, my mum received a text from him and it read, I'm sorry but I can't stay here anymore. My mum walked into another room and called him to ask what was going on. After their conversation, my mum explained to us that her friend was sitting on her bed in her bedroom with the door cracked open and he said that he had heard a noise and looked through the crack of the door and saw a little girl looking back at him. He said that he got up to check it out thinking that he was seeing things and he said that when he opened the door he saw the little girl running away from him. She was apparently wearing a white dress and he said that she ran into the storage room and he explained that she didn't look scared and more like she was laughing and it looked almost as if she was trying to play hide and seek with him. But after that, he just packed his bag and left and I just never saw him again after that. We moved out of that house and nothing has happened to us since then. But surprisingly enough though, but we actually know the people who live in that house today. They have said that they've experienced some, uh, some weird things but... They haven't really gone into detail about it. All I can say is that I'm just happy that I'm not living there anymore. My uncle had always told me about some strange things happening in my grandmother's house when he spent the night. But first, I'm going to talk about his experience and then mine. I'll try and keep this short. So... But to give some backstory on how this house is so haunted, my grandmother has had two miscarriages, one boy, one girl, and her husband, aka my grandfather, passed around the time that this all started happening. My uncle would tell me of events of pot smashing together to wake them up in the middle of the night and seeing shadows and all sorts of stuff. But his most memorable experience was when he was making food around 10pm, when he asked my little cousin if she wanted any food. With the living room being right down the hall from the kitchen, he heard a reply yes. So, he started making the food and asked if she wanted him to bring it over to her. Another faint yes was heard again, so he brings the plate down the hallway to the living room, only to find her dead asleep on the couch. He wakes her up asking if she had been talking to him the whole time and she replied no, why? Still groggy from just being woken up. This, obviously, sent shivers down his spine. Now, in my experience, my cousin and I had spent the night together at my grandmother's house to keep her company so that she wouldn't have to be alone there. But we went outside for a quick smoke and then went back in to finally get some sleep. He slept upstairs while I slept downstairs and I turned the TV on for some background noise and passed out on the couch. It was around 2am when I was woken up to the sound of people whispering from the kitchen. Now, let me remind you that I was asleep on the couch in the living room, which is down the hall from the kitchen. So, me being the curious 17-year-old at the time that I was, I decided to see who was awake and what they were doing. The closer I got to the kitchen, the louder the whispers seemed to get too. And as I stepped into the kitchen, the whispers just stopped and I was left alone with only the sound of my breath going on. I could have swore that I heard people talking in here though, I thought to myself. I decided to look around the house a little more to make sure it wasn't coming from a different room and after every room being empty, I just decided to brush it off and head back to the couch. I only made it halfway down the hallway though to the living room when I started hearing the whispers again. I couldn't make out any words, it just sounded uh, kind of like a group of people talking together in a low voice. I decided to turn around one last time when again the whispers stopped and I was left in the kitchen by myself again. 
at this point, I was freaking out pretty bad, but decided to just sleep just to hurry up and get through the night. As I walked for the third time back to the living room, I started hearing the whispers again coming from behind me. I didn't even look back this time though and decided to just try my best to ignore it by turning up the volume on the TV. And after a little while, I ended up falling asleep to the next morning. When I woke up, I told everyone about what had happened and to be honest, no one was surprised. My grandmother's house is pretty notorious for events such as this and to this day I, I still wonder where the whispers were coming from. I don't know what happened that night but I can't help but think that it was spirits or something. When I was around 11, I had awful nightmares, reoccurring nightmares in fact, about a, a terrifying character and they would always start the same. I would be doing something that brought me intense joy, though I can't really remember those parts and at the height of that feeling, something would happen, something out of a, a slasher film. I was absolutely terrified of anything bloody or insidious as a child. I remember my brother and sister actually sat me down to try and watch an episode of Family Guy to normalize that humor for me, but it was an episode where Peter and the chicken fought, and it was extremely bloody and violent, and I just lost my shit. I say this so that you know that I got disturbed very easily back then. But back to the dream for now. So after something extremely satisfying would begin to conclude, a loud bass hum would fill the air and everyone around me would become instilled with what I can only describe as a, a primal fear. The looks on their faces would make me fall down and sob and I would cover my eyes and I'd hear a slaughterhouse around me. There would be spilling of blood and the sharp pain from head splitting shrieks and cries and it was uh, just honestly so fucked. And after a short moment of listening to my friends and family get murdered, the bass hum would stop and I'd hear someone run around quietly snickering to itself. It was as if a, a child was running around playing hide and go seek or something. And then I'd hear complete silence as their feet would slowly form to the carpet or whatever surface it was. This dream usually took place in many different places as they walked towards my backside. It would always stop at least three feet behind me, but I don't know why, and after some haunting silence, they'd speak, but it was always a different line, and here's a couple that I remember. There was, I'm sorry, yeah, we've all heard it, I love my name, but let's just say it's Rob. Sorry, I'm busy, and this one, which the voice would say a lot, so is it Sunday yet? He would say something along with that sometimes, but I don't really remember now. His voice sounded like a, an older guy, deepening his voice, but also talking in a, a kind of kiddish tone, or just being a little goofy. It wasn't too deep, and it was also a, a little scratchy, and after that I'd wake up around 2 or 4 in the morning, unless I stayed up all night, which I'd wake up to, to be pretty late. So this all happened for a while, probably around two or three months, but when you're dealing with that stuff, it usually just feels longer, and it was also a long time ago, so it was probably shorter than that, but I'm not too sure. It didn't stop abruptly, though. I just had dreams less and less, and it really fucked me up as a kid, and it kind of changed me. It didn't turn me into a different person or anything. I just got much more serious and paranoid after that, which eventually went away. And now, I come to my actual experience. So, this was around uh, two years ago, I think. I was living with my mum in an apartment, and I just went to the movies with three of my friends. We didn't really enjoy the movie or anything, and left early to head to my place, and we arrived, and all of us kind of slumped onto the furniture in the bedroom because we had walked back. So, as we sat down and I turned the TV on for my friends, I heard faint talking in the back, but my mum was home so I didn't think much about it. We put on a paranormal activity show because we actually enjoyed that movie, but really we just sat and talked around and joked mostly. It was honestly a great night and I had liked a girl that was there who was a friend of mine and we were really hitting it off all night, but in the middle of us joking about the movie... 
I heard my mum call me. I hushed my friends and paused the movie and yelled, What ma? There was no answer, so I yelled louder, Ma what? There was no answer again, so I got up and went to the entrance of the hallway, intent on going to my mother's room to express my annoyance for having to get up and see her, but I stopped at the hallway because I heard a, a weird guttural sound from the back. The sound also echoed, so I knew it was from the bathroom. I yelled, Mom, are you in the bathroom? And my friends laughed at this. And then, I recognized the voice. And then, I remembered my mum was in Chico for the night, and I stopped, and I'm sure I had that same look as the ones I remembered in my dreams. My friends thought that I was just fucking around, like I just saw my mum come out of the shower or something. But then, the voice spoke loud enough for them to hear, and I'll never forget what it said. It was kind of a jumbled mess, but the voice said, Yeah, tonight I'll pick you up. Then, I'll rip you in half. But how? How? Rob will know. But no. How? Forget. During that whole dialogue, I told my friends that we need to leave now and I rushed outside as they looked dumbfounded and confused. That last word was the last thing that I heard as I slammed the door too and I'm sure it would have continued. I ran to the street and called my mum and she then told me to call the police so I did. They showed up and did their usual thing and then just left and obviously there wasn't anything in the house. They told us that it was late but that doesn't mean it wasn't our neighbours and I wanted to believe that too but I swear that it sounded exactly what I heard when I was a kid and I swear that it was definitely in my bathroom. Well, after that... My friends told me that it was fine and they all went home, hiding how scared that they were, probably trying to make me feel better or something. I knew too because my best friend was supposed to stay over, but all of a sudden his mum needed him to do stuff at 12 at night. I began to have a dream that night again and I forced myself awake just as I heard that bass hum. I ran for the lights and I didn't sleep much for the next week and a half. But... I haven't had that dream since. I know I might sound crazy, but I know that I heard that thing in my house, and I know for sure that my friends heard it too. So, uh, I'll get started with a, a little bit about myself. I'm 19 years old and currently live in the UK. Previously, I was uh, an extreme skeptic of all things supernatural. Ghosts and demons and all those stories just never phased me as I can normally convince myself of a, a rational explanation. However, lately I've had strange experiences that seem to have changed the way that I think. Not about ghosts or that sort of stuff, but about aliens. You see, I've always had an underlying fear of grey aliens. Not an extreme phobia or anything, such as arachnophobia, where the sufferers can't even look or hear about their feared creatures. In fact, I have an extreme interest in the concept of aliens and wish to believe that they're real and we're not alone in the universe. However, something about the idea of grey aliens just presents me with a, an intense feeling of dread and despair when I think about them in my own life. I can't sleep being able to see outside or facing anything with a corner that I cannot see around. I also find it difficult to sleep without any kind of sound to distract myself with and help me doze off without much thought. Now, approximately three months ago, I encountered my first ever night terror. These were common for my dad who experienced them for years. His night terrors, however, were generally funny. Him seeing weird things like my nan's eyes glowing neon that woke him up screaming. My only night terror to date was very different. I laid in bed with my girlfriend and fell asleep and I remember each part of the dream like it was real. I awoke in the same clothes with the same sleeping position with my curtains in the same position and everything. The curtains were slightly open so I did struggle to sleep but I didn't want to make a fuss and look like an idiot in front of her or anything. A boyfriend who can't sleep because he's scared of the tiniest side of the outside? Get a grip man. The only thing that happened in the dream, though, was that 
I could see a face, a dead center of the gap in the window. It didn't move and it didn't blink, it just sort of floated there looking at me. Whatever it was though, it, it wasn't human. Its face was long, almost shaped like a, a slice of pizza or something rounded at the top and thinned down to the point at the bottom. It may have been that it was blocked by the curtains too, but this was all I could see and as much as I wanted to see to be honest. Its eyes were large, too large, black as night, no pupils, no movement, just there, but I could tell that it was looking at me too. I felt the same sense of dread that I do with the alien fear that I have, the feelings of my heart sinking and an inability to move and in fear of what might be waiting around each corner. I awoke hyperventilating, in fact the same hyperventilating I encountered at the end of my dream. My girlfriend woke me up in fear of what was going on with me but I just shrugged it off as a nightmare. Ever since though, strange things have been occurring in the house. My family had reported strange things happening before, but my lack of experience has led me to believe them to be uh, explainable. Weird things that just happen for a reason or something, such as a lack of balance or wind from outside, uh, the usual. My mother claimed that she had seen a man look at her through the doorway of our living room, but disappear when she looked directly at the area. Her and my brother's girlfriend also experienced the same dream on the same night, talking to twin girls by each of their respective bedsides. My brother and sister claimed to see shadows run past doorways and my father claimed curtains moved on their own with no windows open. I never truly believed these claims until my experiences started. Since that night terror, weird things have been happening around the home which, to be honest, really terrify me. Items have flown from sides which we could not see but were impossible to fall. Entire books which weighed upwards of a kilogram approximately fell to the floor despite being completely on the side, with no parts over the edge. But loud bangs were heard at night from our downstairs that scared our animals and sounded like gunshots, but nothing moved upon investigation. As I live in the UK, it's also extremely difficult to get a hold of firearms, and nobody, as far as I know in our local area, has even held a rifle, let alone shot one in their house. Our cat continues to look at things too, which just aren't there following them around rooms with their eyes which dilate to their maximum level looking at nothing. A knocking has been heard at our back door too which is made entirely of glass mind you, meaning that we would see anyone who would do it. Our technology constantly bugs out too with lights flickering constantly, light bulbs lasting no longer than a few weeks at most and Wi-Fi in our home being ineffective despite constant upgrades and extenders. It almost feels as if something is blocking electrical signals, especially in my room as I plugged a cable straight into the router that connects to my Xbox two floors up, which one night was just pulled out from underneath my door, despite being so tightly wrapped anywhere besides just outside my room that pulling on it from anywhere other than there would conclude with failure. The weird experience though was straight after we heard the knocking on the back door. I retreated lazily up to my room to just play video games and the top landing light was broken again, meaning that it was not on and no other upstairs room lights were turned on with my door being shut and suddenly a, a bright blue flash occurred as if it originated from my room, almost as if someone had just used a, an extremely powerful torch that filled the entire floor for a second, despite my door being completely closed. I have no idea what these things mean and... I try to explain away, but I feel as though each event just keeps drawing me back to that one night terror with that face that scared me to death. Even as I write, I can feel that dread engulf me. I'm uh, unable to stay calm and feeling as though around every corner something just continues to peer around and watch my every moment. I just want to know what's wrong, to be honest. If it is psychological, then what can I do to fix it? I don't know if it is aliens like I believe it might be, but that dread that I feel with the face, these events and my previous feelings about aliens are one and the same and I want to know what I can do to just make it stop. At the time this story took place, I was about 13 years old. 
My parents split when I was pretty young, and my mum had to provide for my sister and myself. And My mum is really honest and thorough with her work, so she found it rewarding to clean offices and houses for money. And my sister and I often went with her to clean up too, and by the time that this story took place, we were pretty used to it. So, my mum had three buildings she cleaned regularly, which we came up with nicknames for. There was the main building, the red building, and the brick building. Brilliant, I know. We had to clean all three buildings that night, so we started with the red building. This, out of all the places that I've ever been to help my mum, was my least favourite. I hated going there. It looked normal from the outside, mind you, but... Every time I took a step inside, I, I felt depressed and uneasy. It was like all the purpose of life had just been sucked out of the world and I just wanted to fall asleep. At this time, it had been a while since we had visited the Red Building and there was this bathroom in the surveillance room that needed to clean badly. The surveillance room was usually locked and I actually had never been in this room. The first thing my sister and I noticed was the wall of monitors each displaying the feet of the security cameras that were everywhere in the building. But we had some fun playing around with the monitors, making one of us stay in the surveillance room while the others make faces and stuff in the camera in another room. I would like to mention too that my sister and I have a close relationship and we've always just been weird. We both laugh at jokes and stupid stuff and we also like to scare each other. Anyway... Our mum got on to us about goofing around and assigned us both some jobs. After about an hour and a half of scrubbing and vacuuming and whatnot, we were almost done and my mum was in the break room kitchen and my sister was hovering somewhere nearby. I was extremely tired by this point and I just wanted to lie down or do anything except work. I was watching my mum prepare the water to mop the kitchen with when she asked me if I would like to mop or go and turn off the lights upstairs. I was so exhausted that I was only thinking about not doing work so I decided to turn off the lights and I headed up the narrow stairs into the kitchen. The layout of the upstairs was odd since it used to be an apartment building but there are two sets of staircases on opposite sides of the building and I went up the ones in the kitchen. The other set was in the entryway of the front door. At the top of those stairs there was this hallway too that I always like to avoid. So I started turning off lights one by one and I was thinking about how we still had two other buildings to clean and I needed to pull myself together. I blocked out my surroundings and was effortlessly flipping switches. But the second that I walked into the hallway that I tried to avoid, I became a little more aware of what I was doing. Ever since I was little, I, I've been afraid of the dark, so I started turning off the lights in the offices that surrounded the hallway. I got carried away in shutting off the lights, to which, when I reached the point to turn off the hallway light, I jumped from a small step in an office doorway to the center of the hall. The hallway ceiling was really high, so the light switch was actually just a string that dangled from it. I wrapped my hand around the string and pulled, and as soon as the room went dark, I was filled with dread. And then, I heard a very soft grunt coming from behind me. It sounded like when a person dies naturally and their body relaxes or something, so all the air in their lungs is just released. As soon as I heard it, my whole body stiffened with fear too and adrenaline and I started to sweat. It felt like if I turned around, I was going to die or something. Like whatever I saw, if I looked behind me, would consume me whole. I felt so powerless and terrified and I didn't know what to think and just that if I stayed there any longer I was going to get hurt. My body took over my mind through adrenaline and I ran down the stairs faster than I knew I could. I ran directly into the surveillance room hoping that my sister was in there and I called out her name. No response. I was so desperate and terrified that I ran over to the monitors and started scanning for anyone near me that I could run to. The first movement I saw was in the screen that showed the stairs that I had just run down and I saw my sister walking down them with her coat and Boba Fett hat on with a mop in her hand. I took a deep breath and lied down on the couch that was in the surveillance room and I was so relieved that it was my sister. I knew that she had just scared me and that 
She always did that, and it made perfect sense. I had thought that she mopped the kitchen and then followed me up the stairs and took the opportunity to scare me. After I calmed down, I walked into the kitchen where I saw my mum and my sister talking. I leaned on the island counter and told my sister that she scared me, and she looks at me and asks, What? I repeated myself, and she asks when she scared me. I told her that she came up behind me upstairs when I was turning off the light, and I laughed and asked if I looked dumb running down the stairs. Both my mum and my sister weren't laughing, though, but they were staring at me with confused faces, so I asked them what. My sister began to say that she was downstairs talking to her mum ever since I walked up to turn the lights off. I told her that I knew that she was lying because I saw her on the cameras walking down the stairs. I described that I saw her holding a mop and that she was wearing both her hat and coat. And then my mum chimes in that my sister wasn't lying and that they really were talking. I began to think at this point that my mum was in the joke too, so I told my sister to follow me to the surveillance room and I pointed to the exact monitor I saw her walking down the stairs on. And that was when she told me that she took off her coat the second we walked into the building and hadn't put it back on since. She also only walked down those stairs once with the mop, but that was way earlier. I was confused and a little bit scared, and when we packed up our things and we got into the car, my sister told me what doppelgangers are. I never knew what they were before this, and I had never heard a story about them either, which only makes it more terrifying for me to be honest. I thought of every way that I could rationalize this, but nothing just ever made sense. First, I thought maybe the footage wasn't live, but then remembered how my sister and I were playing with the cameras. Maybe I was just paranoid about the dark, but I do know for sure what I felt was real. I still don't fully understand what happened, and I wonder what would have happened if I had turned around instead of running. Anyway, I know some people are bound not to believe me, but I'm thankful for the people that don't think I'm crazy because well, they've experienced the same exact thing. So my father has had his fair share of strange and paranormal encounters in his lifetime so far. However, one experience that really stuck to him took place in 1982 when he was 13 and still living in the Philippines. He was attending school at Christ the King Missionary Seminary in Quezon City, a Roman Catholic institution that prepared students for priesthood. Obviously, my father never followed through with the program, thank goodness, as he admitted that he was never really serious about becoming a priest and that joining the seminary was really just a means for him to live more independently. And apparently, this story is partly responsible for changing his mind. So, uh, my father and his friends, John, Rob, Richard and Nick, all attended the seminary, but none of whom actually became priests either. Go figure. Everything stemmed from when Nick got sick with the flu one time. He was quarantined in the seminary infirmary so as to prevent other students from getting sick as it was standard procedure, and uh, no one thought anything of it to be honest. It was when he was released two days later though that things started getting weird. But my dad explained that Nick came back acting abnormally reserved and just quiet. Instead of laughing and joking around in the mass hall, he would just stay silent, sometimes with his head down and sometimes just staring blankly at the window, never looking at or talking to anyone. One day though, during lunch, my dad and the rest of the group noticed tears running down Nick's face as he just quietly cried at the table head still down and still refusing to talk to anyone. Concerned, my dad and his friends notified one of the seminary regents, sort of like a, a cross between a youth leader and an RA, and Nick was summoned into the regent's office. The group approached the regent after the fact, asking what was up with Nick and if he was okay. The regent explained that after asking Nick what was wrong and if he was okay, Nick finally admitted that there's this man who's following me and I didn't want to say anything because I didn't think anyone would believe me. 
Nick was then asked to describe the man who was following him and he explained that the man was wearing a pair of jeans but was shirtless and he apparently had no face. According to the regent, after Nick described what the man looked like, he completely snapped, panicking and sobbing, yelling things at the regent like, I really don't want to see him anymore, please, I don't want to see him, just help me, please help me. The regent along with the prefect, who was sort of like a, a school principal, a priest, who were also present in the office, had to hold Nick down as he was just completely distraught. After praying for a bit, they were able to calm Nick down and ensured him that they'd always be available if he ever needed anything before dismissing him from their office. Although disturbed by the incident, my father initially thought that maybe excessive stress might have been the cause of his friend's outburst or something. However, it should also be noted that the possibility of ghosts and demons and other malicious entities were no surprise to the seminarians, as new students were always initially warned that because the seminary was a house of reformation and that students were preparing themselves to carry out God's work, resistance coming from opposing entities who wanted to drive out students were common and to be expected. Either way, my dad and the rest of the group gave Nick his space for the next couple of days, assuming that he just wanted to be alone for a while until he felt more like himself. That is, until the night things came to a head. Now, everyone was in their dorm rooms, and Nick and my father and their friend Richard had their beds situated right next to each other. Everyone was setting up their mosquito nets and getting ready to sleep when a sudden shout from Nick just startled everyone. He began yelling, get away from me. According to my father, his outcry was followed by two aggressive swings as Nick tried to fight off some unseen assailant. And what happened next, my father still truly doesn't know what to believe. He apparently watched as Nick's head just whipped back as if he was struck by a blow to the jaw. And then his whole body was forcefully thrown into the air. My father, although somewhat religious, is still a fairly skeptical guy and he claims that the way that Nick's body was shoved back just seemed genuine, with no bend to his knees to justify him simply just jumping back like that. If it was all just in his head, then my dad stated that Nick was a really good actor. But the night only got stranger from there. As soon as Nick was struck by this unseen force, he got knocked unconscious and the regent was called immediately followed by the prefect and priest. Together, they carried Nick into the regent's office. As disturbed and afraid as my father was, he, John, and Rob ended up trailing behind them, partly out of concern, but mainly out of plain stupid curiosity. The doors of the regent's office were shut behind the group, and my father was immediately regretting being so nosy. The room was incredibly tense and thick with fear. It was evident on even the priest's face that he was wary and reluctant of having to deal with Nick and a possible demon. The regent, prefect and priest all figured that my dad and the group would stick around to help with praying over him and help him regain consciousness and they quickly do as instructed and start praying the rosary. As if the night wasn't already creepy enough, halfway through praying the Hail Mary, my father's friend John just starts to talk complete gibberish and what my father could only explain as speaking in tongues. After this nonsensical outburst, John promptly collapses and luckily the priest was quick enough to catch him and set him on the floor before he hit his head on anything. At this point, my father is just confused and terrified as all hell, wishing that he'd never decided to join the damn seminary in the first place, and that he could just be safe at home instead, watching episodes of Three's Company with his dad. Of course, there wasn't much else that they could do at that moment, other than continue to pray and hope things got better. John regained consciousness shortly after, almost as if nothing had happened, although noticeably confused. My father actually asked him what the hell caused him to talk like he did, to which John replied with a repeated, I don't know. They finished praying after a while, and Nick was still unconscious. 
deciding that the group had done all that they could do to help. The regent, the prefect and the priest all agreed that the boys should go back to their dorms and get some sleep, telling them that Nick would stay in the office with them overnight, presumably to continue watch and pray over him and perhaps call medical authorities. The group obeyed and returned to their dorm, rejoining the rest of the students who were just as unnerved and unable to sleep from the night's turn of events. My dad's friend Reggie, whose bed was right next to his, meekly asked him if they could share a bed as he was too afraid to be alone, to which my father agreed. My dad remembers that he and Reggie were shaking so violently from fear that he could hear the bed frame shake as well, something that he laughs about now, despite being so unsettled at the time. The next morning, Nick's parents picked him up from the seminary for a two-week leave and Apparently, when he came back the two weeks later, Nick was just back to his normal self, and no one ever brought it up after that. A while after these events, long after my father and his friends had left the seminary, Nick had a falling out with a group over personal issues, and so my dad is just no longer in contact with them. But John is still a close family friend, though, and my father will sometimes bring this story back up with him, and... He's considered extreme anxiety or paranoia and everything as possible explanations for what happened at the seminary. However, those are all just theories and they really don't fit all that well. It remains something that my father just still cannot fully explain. I mean, the fact that he had a flu and everything could explain why maybe he was having some sort of hallucination. But... My father describes that night when he was like punched and pushed and thrown into the air or whatever it was. He, uh, he still wonders over that. I'm from Canada, Alberta, and that's all I can really say is I have to keep things as um, private as possible. I've worked at this nursing home for about a year and a half as a cleaner and a food server now. I usually work the late cleaning shifts and as of late I've had weird things happen. Things just keep progressing the longer I work here too. And things are especially strange in one area of the building particularly. I can assure you that this is all 100% true as well. I used to be skeptical about things like this until I uh, started working here. So... Here's when it all started. I went in to do my late shift as any other day, but please note that I'm also pregnant in these stories. So late shifts include cleaning the dining rooms and the kitchens and doing all the laundry from that day. But mind you, this is a, a really big old facility and I'm working alone on late shifts. There's two dining rooms that can sit 70 people at least and one kitchen and one laundry room that have those big industrial washers and dryers. So... There is always lots of cleaning to be done. I was doing my usual routine, sweeping the floors of the first dining room before mopping it, when I uh, suddenly smelled a really bad odour, and it made me sick to my stomach. I thought that maybe the cooks had left some rotten meat in the trash can, but to my surprise, all the garbages were cleaned out. I went back down to the dining room, though, to figure out where the smell was coming from, and I followed the smell down past the kitchens and into the hallway where the rooms are. This was the east wing of the building and there's only five residents living in this area of the building and it includes our laundry room area as well. This wing is the older wing that has yet to be renovated so a lot of the rooms are empty. I followed the smell down the hall all the way to the empty room at the end of the hallway and I knew nobody lived in there. I knew all my residents well and where they all lived. This room is room 218 and you could just smell the foul odour emanating from the door. I assumed that the cleaning ladies from the morning had left a trash bag full of rotten food in there or something. They often leave things behind while cleaning so no harm done I thought I'll just throw it out myself. But because of fire safety policies of our facility I had a master key that unlocked all the rooms. I unlocked the door and opened to the room and the smell just hit me and almost made me puke right there. Covering my nose, I proceeded to walk into the room as there was an immediate noticeable change in temperature. It was like the AC had been running in this room all day and I just had a, a terrible uneasy feeling the whole time that I was in there and I immediately wanted to leave. 
I searched the room quickly for anything that could be making the horrible smell, and I was confused when all there was was a, an empty closet and bathroom. I just thought that maybe it could be a dead animal stuck in the wall and I'd have to leave a note to my manager. I shut unlocked the door and started down the hall and then suddenly I heard a really loud knock against the door. A chill ran through my whole body as I turned around to face the door and I was sure nobody was in there as I'd just been in there. And then I heard it again but this time much louder. Twice as hard on the door in fact and I felt pale. Being the pregnant and cowardly girl that I was, I just began to run down the hall as fast as I could manage. I didn't know what or who or what the hell was going on with that room, but I felt that I had a reason to be afraid. I got back to the kitchen fast and dialed 911 on the phone, as I was sure that someone had broken in and was messing with me. I told the operator that it was a possible break-in, and they told me that there was a policeman on patrol two minutes away, and I sighed at my luck and waited at the front doors. When the policeman finally showed up, I explained everything as I showed him what room. He went down the hall and cleared the room, and he told me that nobody was found, and the room had still been locked. Even the windows were untouched, and he said that there was no smell. I was, a uh, I was startled by this because only a few minutes ago, I could have sworn that I smelt rotting meat and heard the knocks. I ruled it out as my tiredness and my pregnancy brain at the time, and he took a report and went on his way. Mind you, I was still very uneasy as I finished up my shift, but this was the, uh, the first time I've experienced anything paranormal. The second time, again, I was working the late shift one night and I was in the laundry room just finishing up the last bit of my shift. I was folding the laundry and was just caught in my own thoughts. Now, this room has really large windows. But being late and dark, you can see your reflections in the surrounding room through the dark windows too. I looked down at the laundry and looked back up and my heart stopped as I saw an old man with black dark eyes just staring back at me smiling. I screamed and looked behind me, thinking that it was a resident messing with me, and to my horror, there was nobody there. I felt really uneasy as I looked around, and I looked out in the hall, but there was nobody there either. I said hello, but there was no answer, and after that, I, I felt sick. I finished what laundry I had left, and locked up the laundry room, and as I was locking the door, I could see an elderly man standing at the end of the hallway in my peripheral. I turned to look, and it was the man who was just behind me a few minutes ago. He was smiling, eyes grey and black. I take note that he definitely isn't familiar, and he's a tall, heavier man wearing jeans and a, a white t-shirt that's tucked in. He was a bald man and clearly elderly, and he was just standing there, smiling at me. The smile sent shivers down my spine too, and I thought maybe that we got a new resident and my manager just forgot to mention it or something, and so I called out. Ah, uh, hello sir, do you need anything? I'm Bell and I'm working on the night shift, uh, it's nice to meet you. I managed under my intense anxiety, but he just stood there smiling. Uh, if you need anything, feel free to call the staff phone, okay? Uh, I'll be over in no time. I was so very uneasy and just wanted to go back to the staff room, and he just stood there continuing to grin. I smiled back and waved nervously, and I said, Uh, have a good night, sir, and uh, feel free to call me if you need anything, okay? I walked away in a hurry, and just as I got back to the staff room, the phone started blaring. I looked at the caller ID and it's coming from 218. I felt really uneasy, but it must have been just a new resident or something. So perhaps he was just too shy to talk to me. I didn't know. But I hesitated and finally answered. Uh, hello sir? How can I help you tonight? There was a, a deep crisp growl from the other end of the phone and it didn't sound at all human. It scared the shit out of me. And then the phone just went to static. Uh, hello? Hello? I said nervously. 
the phone went to dial tone and I sat there for I don't know how long and my heart was pounding in my throat. Due to uh, safety protocols, I had to go check on the resident too. As much as my instincts told me to avoid him, I walked nervously down the east wing, my heart pounding in my ears. I came to room 218 and I knocked on the door and asked if the person was okay. But there was no answer. So I knocked again and still no answer. And I became concerned. What if my resident was attacked by something? That growl, it definitely wasn't human. But I was also pregnant and didn't want to storm in and be attacked by God knows what. So I turned around to get the phone from the staff room and then I heard the door creak open very slowly behind me. I walked over to the door slowly and before pushing it open, I said, Uh, hello? Sir, are you alright in there? I pushed the door open at this point. I was expecting something or someone to jump out at me, but when I opened the door, there was nothing. Nobody in the room and no belongings that would imply someone lived there. It was just completely empty, but I had a, a terrible feeling like I was just being watched, and I searched the room and that smell of rotten meat filled my nose again. And then, I heard the most terrifying laugh, and it burst through my ears like knives. It was such a deep and low and just cackling laugh, and I literally shit myself as I ran out of the room so fast. I didn't even bother to shut the door, and as I was running, I was thinking to myself, am I going crazy? I could have sworn that there was no one in there. I mean, I didn't see anyone. What the hell's going on? That night, I... I finished my shift quickly and I just walked the fuck out of there early. I didn't give a shit about spending one more minute there. But sadly, this is not where it ends. But due to being a soon to be single mum and pregnant, I had no other option but to stay here until I was on maternity leave, as my husband died a few months ago due to a, a drunk driver hitting him. He was supposed to come home that night to cook a meal and at my positive pregnancy test and all that. And he didn't even get to know that he was going to be a dad. Anyway, I was stuck there for a while, but that's where I'm uh, going to leave it off for now. If you guys would like to hear more of my experiences, then uh, please be sure to leave a comment below, as I definitely have more than a few to share. Thanks for listening. So I live in the UK and am a 21 year old female. I run a B&B and am pretty used to having to make weirdos feel welcome. However, they are mostly harmless at the end of the day. But last week's experiences was by far the worst and most terrifying. It all started on the Monday night of last week. It was the end of summer break so a lot of tourists were travelling around my area so it was good business for the B&B. Staying in one of the seven rooms, I had a foreign couple and their baby. In another room, two girls who had travelled from Australia, and in the attic room, I had a lone man who, to be honest, I got bad vibes from at the very beginning of meeting him. He was tall and had long greasy hair and a dirty unkept fingernails, and altogether he just looked uh, very dishevelled. He didn't really talk too much either. He just asked what room he would be staying in and walked in there and shut the door behind him. Still, nothing too out of the ordinary in my opinion. Unfortunately though, it didn't stop there. Now, I spend most of my time in my personal hobby room. I mostly watch TV for a lot of the days and then just go upstairs to my bedroom to go to sleep. I climbed the tall staircase and went to my room and I checked my alarm clock and it was only 9.30pm so I thought I might just lie down and watch some videos on my computer. Halfway through watching my favourite movie... I was interrupted by a loud knocking on my door. It wasn't an average knock though, it was really aggressive. I looked through the peephole in the door and was surprised to see that it was the strange man who was staying in the attic bedroom. I opened the door and he started talking straight at me, not letting me get a word in, telling me that the water pipe in his room had burst and that there was water spurting everywhere and that he wanted me to fix it. 
I obviously apologized to him and, without questioning anything, let him lead me to his attic room. But the first red flag was the fact that he shut the door and locked it behind him. The next thing was that there was no water anywhere. And then I remembered that there were not actually any pipes anywhere in the attic. I don't know how I forgot, but I guess I was more worried about the guy asking for a refund than actually questioning whether he was being legitimate about the whole pipe burst thing. But now... I was stuck and the only other people who were staying at the B&B were two floors below me so they would never be able to hear me scream. I'm also a woman so I had no chance of being able to fight off this guy. I looked at him and he shot me a yellow grin and he lurched for me but I leaped out of the way. I noticed something sticking out of his pocket jacket and it was a knife handle. He pretty much ripped it out of his pocket and started swiping at the air with it. I bolted out of there and heard him running at top speed behind me until we got to the second floor where I heard him running back up to his room. I locked myself in my room and called the police immediately. I also called the other guests on their landlines and told them to lock their doors and stay in their rooms. When the police arrived, they found the man hiding in the wardrobe in his room. I guess that he freaked out when he heard the sirens and just hid in there. Apparently, he only had one backpack and... It contained a, a toothbrush, duct tape, a Stanley knife, a Phillips head screwdriver and some intimate things which I can't even write down but I'm sure you can guess what I'm talking about. They never found out for sure what he had planned on doing to me but from the contents of his bag we all had a pretty good idea. But they took him away in cuffs and thankfully I've never seen the guy again. I plan on moving away at some point soon because I just uh, don't really feel comfortable with him knowing where I live. Also, every day I just see that grin that he gave me as he was taken away and his wild eyes. This is definitely the most scary experience that I've ever had. So this is a story that my mum told me from her childhood. I have put it in my own words, but have not changed any of the details of the events. So, here it is. Memories are odd. Every time that you reflect on one, you skew it just a bit, and after years and years, your memories become a disfigured version of what actually happened. It's kind of like that grade school game, Telephone, where you whisper something to the person next to you, and then they whisper what they think you said to the person next to them, and so on, and... By the time it gets back to you, the phrase being passed around is nothing like the original phrase. I've often wondered how different my childhood was compared to how I remember it. How many details I've changed, how many things I recall that may not have actually happened at all. I fully accept that not everything is as I think it was, and I'm fine with that. But one memory, though, haunts me in vivid and precise brushstrokes. Funny how... Now the ones you'd rather forget seem to be the ones that just refuse to relinquish their clarity. The memory I'm referring to takes place in October of 1986, just outside of Dallas, Texas. I still remember the dress I was wearing. It was yellow with white polka dots, long sleeves, and went all the way past my ankles as per my parents' religious requirements. I hated that dress, but at 11, my parents didn't yet think that I was capable of choosing appropriate attire for myself. I hated it because it was rather hard to move in and my mum had made it herself and it was pretty tight from mid-thigh down. Anyway, my sister who was a bit older than me had just gotten a driver's license and she wanted to take the car out. My mum said that she could as long as she took me with her. She agreed, grabbed the keys and off we went. We left around six-ish and it was already getting dark but... Uh, my sister, who was a little uh, uncomfortable behind the wheel, wanted to drive in the evening so that she would have less traffic to deal with. Well, we also stuck to the side streets and back roads until we worked our way to a stretch of relatively desolate highway. So we'd been driving around just listening to the radio and embracing our first true taste of freedom for about an hour. We were just circling back and forth along some 10 or so miles of the USHW 80 between Mesquite and Forney, Texas, just outside of Dallas. It's a little busier there now, but back then it was uh, just a 10-mile stretch of trees and railroad tracks. 
It was there that we heard the engine clunk, and my sister's novice driving skills became apparent as the car sputtered a few hundred yards before dying and rolling to a stop. We'd run out of gas, and the closest gas station was a few miles back. This was before cell phones, so the only thing that we could do was grab the gas can from the trunk and walk back to the station. Remember that poorly constructed polka dot dress? Well, this is where that comes into play. After about a hundred yards, it was obvious that it would be more trouble than it was worth for me to hobble behind my sister for several miles, so she handed me the keys and told me to just wait in the car. I got back in the car and locked all the doors and just watched the rear window until my sister was out of view. I was a very meek and timid and easily frightened little girl at the time and it didn't take long for the dark to infiltrate my psyche. But there were no street lights and I hadn't seen another car since my sister left. But the only light was from the moon which was full enough that I could see the thick tree line about 30 yards off the road. After what seemed like an eternity alone in the dark, my fear and nerves began to really fray. It was completely silent and not even the crickets were chirping. I became acutely aware of just how unnervingly silent it was. I wanted it to end but at the same time was afraid of what might end it. So I just sat petrified, almost anticipating to hear the boogeyman's whispers in the wind at just any moment. All I could think to do was to try and fall asleep and hopefully by the time that I woke up, my sister would be back. I leaned the seat back and closed my eyes and tried my best to just block the boogeyman from my mind. Another 15 minutes or so passed while I turned this way and that way, just trying to find a halfway comfortable position. It was in the midst of the fidgeting that an eerie feeling just ran down my spine. A feeling that I just wasn't alone and... It was a feeling of unshakable dread that I was being watched. I was lying on my side facing the steering wheel, looking downward at the floorboard, my back to the passenger window, my eyes pressed tightly shut, and I was afraid to open them, afraid of what I couldn't see, of what I might, in fact. I took a deep breath and counted to three and opened my eyes, and there was nothing there. I took another deep breath and quickly shifted my gaze to the driver's side window and I exhaled seeing nothing there either. <laughs> you're okay, you're okay, I told myself. I sat there wide eyed just staring straight ahead focusing on the steering wheel for another 10 minutes or so. And that's when all at once and all of a sudden I felt stricken with a, a paralyzing sense of terror and the voice in my head just started repeating, don't turn around. But my heart began racing faster in my chest and my body stiffened and my limbs felt so heavy as an inner panic had started to take hold. I tried telling myself that it was all just in my head and there was nothing outside of my window, that I was just working myself up. But to my utter horror however, a shadow shifted off the driver's side seat and then filled it back up again, followed by three taps on the glass behind me. That shadow had been covering that seat since before I had even opened my eyes as I had hardly blinked since opening them. That means that whoever or whatever was outside the car had just been standing there, watching me. As this terrifying thought ran through my head, but there were three more taps, louder this time, and I knew that I couldn't just ignore them anymore. I mustered up all the courage that I could and turned to meet the tapper. Uh, hello? I nervously whispered as my eyes tried to focus on the figure outside the window. Aren't you a little young to be out here all alone, little lady? Where are your parents? His voice was deep and had a, an authoritative tinge to it. As he spoke, chills went down my spine. Suddenly, the air felt cold and the night felt sinister. The man was abnormally tall the top of the window well below his chest line. His hands were extremely muscular and his fingers long and needly. As my eye tried to focus, he bent his enormous slender frame over enough to peer in the window. He was clean shaven, revealing extremely sunken cheeks and eye sockets too. His eyes themselves were bulging outward and seemed too large for his face and while it could have just been the night, 
I swear that they were completely black. Little girl, he repeated. I asked where your parents are. Uh, I'm with my sister, we are... He cut me off and pulled out a flashlight shining into the car. I can't understand you. I'm going to have to ask you to roll down the window. It's alright, I'm a cop. The ambient light from the flashlight allowed me to see that he was in fact in an officer's uniform and for a brief moment, a relief hit me. Rolling down the window, I spoke a little louder. I'm with my sister and we broke down and she went to get some gas. Uh, I couldn't go with her because I can't walk in this dress. A slight grin came across his face. Ah, I see. So you're not out here all alone then? He said, almost gleefully. Uh, yes sir, uh, just until my sister gets back. And when will she be back then? The closest station is a, a few miles away. That could take a while, right? My relief was starting to dissipate as the familiar feeling of looming dread returned. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, she's been a couple of hours now, I guess. Hmm, he said. Tell you what, why don't you come with me and we can go and get your sister. You won't have to walk. How does that sound? It hadn't dawned on me until then, but I suddenly realized that I hadn't seen any headlights in either direction for 20 minutes by this time. I turned to look out the rear window and started to tremble as I confirmed that there was in fact no car in any direction within any eyesight. But where's your cop car? I almost hesitantly asked. Uh, right over there, uh, just through the trees. He pointed to the tree line in the distance. Haven't you ever wanted to ride in a cop car? I think I should just wait here for my sister to get back. Uh, she won't be much longer. Look, it's past curfew and if you don't get home soon, I'll have to arrest you, okay? Your parents won't like it if you get arrested now, will they? Now, a new fear entered my 11-year-old brain. The fear that I could be arrested. But my instinct said to not get out. I'm sorry, sir, I said, rolling up the window. I really should wait for my sister. As the window was about an inch from closing, he stuck his fingers through trying to stop me and I ended up smashing them between the door and the glass. He shrieked in pain, pulling his hand back. Oh, you fucking little bitch! You smashed my fucking fingers! Oh, I'm sorry, I said through the now closed window, backing up in my seat as far from the door as I could. He started pulling on the door handle violently and shaking the car back and forth. Open this fucking door, you little bitch! Do you know how long you'll go to jail for resisting arrest? He pulled out something that looked like a nightstick and started banging on the roof of the car and the window. He smacked the window again and a spider web of cracks erupted from where the club struck. Now, I knew that it was only a matter of time before he got in and was afraid that he'd follow through on the promises of making things worse. I said okay through frantic sobs, not even realizing that I had started crying at this point. He suddenly got completely calm and said, Well, alright then. Go ahead and step out of the vehicle and follow me to my car. Y yes sir. I rolled up the window and stepped out of the car. This way, he said. Tremors ran through my body as I slowly began to follow the man. I knew that something wasn't right, and all I could think was that he was leading me into something unspeakable behind those trees. I wanted to run, but with my dress, I wouldn't make it far before he caught me, and where would I go even if I could? We were about halfway to the tree line, 40 feet away, when headlights lit up the field that we were standing in. Come on, he snarled, grabbing my arm and pulling me along at a hastened pace. We were 10, maybe 15 feet from the trees when the shouts started. The headlights were now beaming directly on us like spotlights from heaven when several voices, all female, started yelling in our direction. They started yelling, get away from that man, little girl. That man's not a police officer. He's a bad man. Let her go, you demon. God is watching you. Little girl coming here to us and get away from the bad man. They just sent a barrage of shouts until the man let go of me and ran into the trees. They yelled to me to run to them as fast as I could and 
So I did, as hard as I could, ripping my dress in the process. Two women, in thigh-length dresses, stood outside the open side doors of a, an old white church van. They urged me to get in and I jumped inside into the arms of another woman and heard the door slam behind me. There were six ladies all together inside the van, all older, larger women. It's alright sweetie, you're safe now, we won't let the bad man hurt you, okay? One of them reassured me. I said through tears that I have to wait for my sister and they reassured me that they'll wait here and keep the bad man away. Every so often, they would start yelling for me to not look out the window and pulled me into their chest to shield my eyes. But curiosity got the better of me and I peered out against my better judgement, prying my eyes sideways away from the woman who was holding me. And what I saw still haunts my nightmares. It was the man, now completely nude, running down on all fours in and out of the tree line and through the field between us too. I don't know what he was doing, but he was moving quickly and kind of in a, an unnatural way. Sometimes he'd come as close as a few feet from the van and just make the most disturbing guttural grunts and growls that I've ever heard. The ladies tried to distract me by singing nursery rhymes and gospel hymns and any time he got too close they would roll down the windows and shout him back. He would disappear and reappear like clockwork until finally my sister appeared, gas can in hand and on the road behind us. I told my sister what had happened and she said that the worst feeling had come over her and she was running the whole way back. The ladies surrounded us forming a big circle around the car as my sister filled it with gas. The man was now standing 10 feet outside of the tree line, his clothes back on, watching us the whole time and he looked and just never spoke as they told him to just leave us alone and not get any closer. When the car finally started, the lady said that they'd follow us to make sure that we'd make it home. We went up about um, half a mile and made a U-turn to head back and as we crossed past the place that we'd been stranded, the man was on all fours again, completely nude, sniffing at the pavement where we'd been stranded. The old church van was behind us almost the whole way home and I never took my eyes off of it. I was afraid that somehow the bad man would get us if they weren't there but as we turned on our street I, I lost sight of them and they didn't turn in behind us nor did I see a single vehicle pass on the cross street. Maybe they just turned around and just left, I thought at the time. My mother was waiting out of the front porch for us as we pulled up and it was obvious that she'd been crying. She said that she'd gotten an awful feeling that something bad had happened and we'd been gone a long time. I told her everything that happened and she called the police who came to the house to take a statement. I thought that that was the last time that I'd ever hear about that bad man, but unfortunately, a couple of months later, I saw a news story about a girl that had gone missing from a park close to the area where a car had broken down, and witnesses said that the last they saw of her, she was talking to a tall, lanky man in an officer's uniform. Sometimes I think back on that night, and I shiver when I think of that bad man. Other times, though, I... I think of the ladies in the van and how they showed up just in time and how they just vanished without a trace. I wondered then and I still wonder now if maybe I was being protected. I'm not too sure and I know that that whole thing just sounds a little bit crazy but man, what a weird night. The following account happened several years ago in Nepal. I travelled there with my sister M and two of her friends from high school VNA. We'd hoped to escape the hustle and bustle of the city life and immerse ourselves in the mystical mountain paradise to enjoy its culture as well as trek along one of the many Himalayan trails. However, limiting circumstances forced us to go during monsoon season, a combination of increasing heat and humidity that results in almost incessant rains. So, as you can imagine, there was scarcely a tourist to be found, especially on the hiking trek. Dense sopping clouds had snuffed out any meager light, and milky fog obscured the view more often than not as we trudged along the circuit, but we had a blast nonetheless. 
The track itself warrants a telling of its own, albeit a far less serious one, what with V falling victim to a battalion of bloodthirsty leeches lured out by rain, and A getting entangled in escapades, nearly getting knocked out cold from flirting with a farmer's wife. Though battered and bruised, we emerged from the trail victorious though and returned to the capital. Our flight back home was due the very next morning, which meant that we only had one day to explore Kathmandu. Kathmandu is a, quite a polarizing place, with labyrinthian streets and alleyways riddled with kitschy aesthetics and stimuli that push one's senses to their limits. Navigating Kathmandu by yourself, especially at night, is next to impossible in fact. The heavily polluted air and suffocating traffic doesn't help either, and really, the only one among us who took a, a liking to the city was V, but she was always big on everything South Asian and was smitten by the various temples. Which is why with strain leaking from our muscles, our limbs jittering from our two week long odyssey, we were dragged along and subjected to her ministrations and spiritualism and greater meaning and whatnot. But by the time that we staggered out of our final sightseeing destination, the Monkey Temple, it was almost dark. But we kept casting apprehensive looks backwards, prepared to fend off the prowling gangs of thieving monkeys skittering in our wake, looking for any opportunity to dispose us of food or the next best thing. One of the little buggers actually took off with my glasses, in fact. As we were descending into the city having left the temple grounds, our luck got cursedly worse. We heard thunder echoing back on itself in the distance. Clouds, feathery and alive, billowed up at an alarming rate, their colour morphing from shades of purple to jet black, flecked with lightning. It started raining too, and heavy rain that pummeled us as we sought shelter. We splashed through ditches already knee-deep with rainwater and hurtled down alleyways where we hid under a tin roof at the side of the road, our drenched clothing clinging to our skin. Just as we were catching our breaths, a... Uh, a flurry of wet motion appeared in the corner of my eyes. My sister, M, had darted onto the road and swung her hands upwards. She was always spontaneous and decisive, explosively so in fact, and when she spotted distant white headlights, barely discernible through the downpour, she gambled on it being a taxi and it paid off. We clambered into the Suzuki with a collective sigh of relief, the prospect of immediate shelter overshadowing the struggle to create space for our bags within the tiny vehicle. It was a, an impossibly tight fit, but we somehow managed. The scruffy-headed driver, whose calm and deliberate tone of speaking weirded us out a bit, turned around in the near-pitch blackness of the taxi and asked us with a toothy grin where to. We looked at each other in momentary confusion before realizing that we hadn't accommodated this final day spent in Kathmandu into our plan and, because of our unfamiliarity with the city, had no idea what to say. The driver seemed to pick up on this though and didn't hesitate to suggest taking us to the cousin's hostel, an excellent establishment if he were to be believed. Out of options and utterly exhausted, we just meekly consented. With thinly masked Lee in his face, he told us that we'd love it there and that the first round of drinks was on him. Careening through the streets, we tried to respond to the driver's prying small talk, but the hypnotic ding of rainfall on the roof was all it took. As I watched the blur of passing objects and people through the rain-speckled window, like wavy apparitions, I plunged into sleep. When I woke up, we were still in the car and... Everybody else was asleep, and in spite of the piss poor visibility and my grogginess, it was evident that we were in a completely different part of the city now. But there was little to no street lighting, and all I could make out were jagged outlines of poles and looming concrete walls and structures. But no people were to be seen, and unease crept up on me. How long had we been driving for? Where exactly was this person taking us? What quelled my suspicion and what made us go along with such a shady plan to begin with was the perceived nature of the people of Nepal. Every single Nepali that we came across was welcoming and kind to a tea which along with the supposed safety of the country had lulled us into a false sense of security. It hadn't occurred to us that this fickle trust could be easily exploited. The driver had noticed that I was awake and flashed that toothy grin at me telling me that it was good timing and to wake the others. 
When I stepped out of the car onto the muddy, deserted street, I couldn't help but feel the sense of unease sliding through me again. It was a sentiment, too, that was beginning to be shared with the others as we took in this cousin's hostel. We were taken aback, though. Mold-flecked walls with degraded and worn rendering surrounded a house that, despite being camouflaged by the darkness and rain, was unmistakably dilapidated. Granted, it was only marginally worse than the rest of Kathmandu's post-earthquake infrastructure, but it gave off a, a disconcerting air of ruin. In other words, no way in hell were we about to stay here. At least one of us was preparing to voice disapproval of the entire situation when the driver started bounding around and, in a, a very animated manner, attempted to usher us through the opened, rusted gate into the awaiting yard. We complied, but only to get out of the rain as it was now flooding over the alleyways created by the narrow lanes of houses and carrying with it its swirling refuse. When we stepped inside, we were met with a carnival of just disgusting imagery illuminated by a single dim light bulb suspended from tarp that covered most of the yard. Revulsion and dread supplanted whatever unease that we might have harbored because it was just beyond repulsive. But what I can only describe as a, a sickening miasma covered everything and it just reeked of foul odor that made my eyes water. The concrete ground was littered with waste and the walls smudged with caked dirt. The single plastic table was just smeared with who knows what, and I shit you not, there were needles just scattered everywhere. We immediately knew that we needed to get the hell out of there, but it was only when we turned around and looked at the driver under the light that the seriousness of our predicament fully dawned on us. This man looked like diseased roadkill. Sunken, bloodshot eyes stared at us from a face that was just covered with livid sores and scratches. His toothy grin now revealed decayed and cracked teeth, and we were definitely in a drug addict's den. Holy shit, V, I thought. How did you not notice? I mean, you were sitting right next to him. I wasn't sure how to react at this point. He was just standing there, blocking the gate, staring us down. He obviously didn't pose much of a threat. I mean, there were four of us against one frail drug addict meth head. Well, three of us at least. V's always scared easily, and as I glanced at her, I noticed that she was visibly shaking. She'd be useless should things escalate into a confrontation, verbal or otherwise. A2, for all his loud bravado, he was the first to peel when shit hit the fan. I was starting to get really nervous at this point. I mean, what if he had a weapon on him? A used syringe which he'd lash out at us or something. The last thing I wanted was for one of us to contract something. My mind was racing. How were we going to leave? I was certain that there wasn't a taxi within miles of this deserted hellhole, that's for sure. And where were we to begin with? Our phones were useless with our local numbers. I cursed myself for being this obliviously careless. As I was being dissolved by the acids of anxiety, M spoke up. Honestly, she was everything one could possibly want in a leader. Level-headed and perceptive, and she managed to bolster our confidence by taking control. She calmly addressed the driver, trying to explain to him that we'd forgotten to take care of something and that we'd need to rush back to town. We'd pay him double the fare for the trouble, but he wasn't having any of it. With wild gesticulations and an irritated tone, he started speaking rapidly. We barely comprehended him in his frantic state. He was saying that it would be impossible to drive back under these conditions and that our best bet was to just wait it out at the bar. He stressed multiple times that the first round was on him as if that would entice us. He pointed towards the house and it's then that we noticed the interior of the house was completely dark. The wide doorless entrance like a, an ominous invitation into nothingness that lay beyond, threatening to swallow whoever dared to approach. He told us to follow him inside for the drinks and started waving his hand as if time was of the essence. He was starting to rile me up and I felt like giving him a verbal beatdown, but as if sensing that, M reacted. 
she realized how important it was to keep level-headed and told him coolly that we simply had no time and if he wasn't capable of driving then he would help us contact another taxi or something. He either didn't understand or willfully ignored her and kept urging us to come inside with him though. It got to the point that he just kept repeating the same thing over and over, eyes dimmed to a sickly grey and flesh sunk at the side of his mouth. He kept insisting. And if this wasn't all enough, there was a, a very hostile air about him too. He looked like he was uh, making a concerted effort not to lunge at us, fidgeting with shaking hands. If necessary, I wouldn't have felt bad for a second to topple him like a sack of laundry if he so much as tried anything. V spurted out, very unspiritual like, fuck this, let's just leave. At this, he surprisingly went quiet, as if unsure what to do faced with our departure. He turned around and stared at the house and then back at us. He hissed, okay, I get phone. With surprising agility, he scurried off towards the entrance too and disappeared into the darkness. We looked at each other and there was a momentary silence, the only sound that of the rain beating against the tarp and lightning booming in the distance. V again says, fuck this, traces of panic in her voice this time. She says, this isn't normal, we need to leave now. I said, and go where? You saw for yourself that there's not a soul out there and it's raining cats and dogs. Despite trying to be the voice of reason, I knew M felt the same thing all of us did. A lingering sense of dread that something was just horribly wrong. A was fidgeting too now fear had obviously burrowed into his heart and I too felt afraid. That's when we heard it though, the faint rustling coming from inside the house, crackling followed by the unmistakable sound of whispering. My heart was now beating like a drum. I felt jelly-legged and none of us moved a muscle but we were all petrified. The whisperings continued too and they were just barely discernible through the rain, but loud enough to be picked up. With my eyes trained on the blackness of the entrance, I slowly started inching backwards, and the others followed suit. Just as we were turning around, it happened. The sound of heavy footsteps rushing us, a stampede emanating from within. We bolted, dashing through the gate into the street, and from the corner of my eye, I saw four of them mere steps behind us, with another bounding through the house entrance. They started shouting and shrieking at us as we hurtled down the street, sprinting desperately before turning to a side road. One of them threw something at us, in fact, and it fell short and landed with a sickening thud behind me. We ran blindly and turned corner after corner, knowing that a single misstep would kill any of us. V was falling behind us though, panting like a horse pushed far beyond its limits. Thankfully, the shouting was becoming fainter and fainter though. We kept running, not daring to catch our breaths or reorientate ourselves, simply following M's lead through roads and alleyways. At one point, I thought my heart would burst, and just when I was ready to give up, V almost out of sight too, we finally spotted headlights. We must have seemed like lunatics, surrounding the car left and right and center, banging on the windows, screaming for help. It was a miracle the driver, an elderly man, decided to help us at all, in fact. We clambered inside, gasping and heaving, and we wasted no time telling him to hightail it out of there. It took us the better part of an hour to calm down, and V was just hysterical. A's entire frame was trembling, but once this experience infiltrated our minds... We just never felt safe, even when stepping onto the aeroplane out of Nepal the next morning. We decided against going to the police in the end. I mean, we had no evidence, and even if we did, we had no way of finding that house again. Our backpacks were lost, of course. Mam's forethought of keeping our passports in her waste pack spared us much suffering, luckily. To this day, I'm still filled with dread at the thought of that that entrance into darkness with murderers lying in ambush. It was 2004 and I was 19 and 
My friend, B, was renting the upstairs bedroom of a house that everyone knew as the murder house. You see, in 1987, a, a man was shot in this house. He ran outside and banged on the neighbor's door, leaving a blood smear on the door and a trail of blood from the house. No one answered and he was dragged back into the house by two men and brought to the basement where he was shot in the head and subsequently dismembered. And the men took his remains and dumped them in a reservoir. So yeah, this was uh, our little town's dark secret. But B had been living there for a few months and I would come over most nights after I finished work. I was delivering pizzas so I always had cash from tips and we do what 19 year olds do try and get some beer or whatever. Funny enough, uh, we'd usually just hang out with whatever was around and put some music and play rummy. I know, hard partying, right? But he never felt uneasy in the house. He never bought into the whole haunted house aspect. Despite that though, he just never went into the basement. No one except the owner, in fact, went into the basement. It wasn't a rule or anything. We could do whatever we wanted there, really, but... The basement was just... no. So one summer night in June, we're all at our friend Todd's house. He was older, but a cool guy, and he didn't mind a bunch of teenagers hanging out. He liked the party scene, I guess, and so we were there. It was me, B, a, a girl named AJ and C. But we were all broke at the time, and Todd had some other friends over, more his age, that we just didn't feel like hanging out with, so... B says that we should just go to his place and figure out what we're going to do for the night. AJ and C take her car and I take B and my shitty old Toyota pickup that forever smelled like Pizza Hut. B's house was only a couple of blocks away and we get there and head upstairs to his room. This being 2004, not everyone had cell phones yet. Only AJ had one so we were all trying to think of who to call to salvage the night and whatnot. There was no luck, so I put in a CD and we just proceeded to go to the old reliable boring deck of cards. It was just the four of us in the house. Uh, the owner of the home had his dog in the room right next to us. He was rarely home at night though and his room had a window that overlooked the front yard and the street. We barely got the first round started when we began to hear footsteps on the stairs. Huh, must be Frank coming home, B said. We didn't think too much of it until we heard the front door open and close and then more steps on the stairs. We all looked at each other and checked the window and we didn't see anything suspicious but we also didn't see Frank's car. We heard footsteps coming up a third time and B and I had had enough and we were going to confront whoever was trespassing. We were both 19 and I had been a football player in high school and was still in pretty good shape. B had never played sports, but was in a similar condition as me. Basically, we could have held our own in a fistfight if need be, but usually we could just intimidate people into backing off. So, it's about midnight and we head down the stairs. AJ and C stay up in the room. We were both pumped up, ready to go kick out any drunk or meth head that happened to just wander in. We don't see anyone and nothing looks out of place though. We go outside and sit on the porch and nothing seems odd. There's regular traffic on the semi-busy street, but I start to get the feeling that just something's wrong. That something feels off. I see things in the front yard that look like they're moving. Like shadows darting around. I kind of dismiss it as me being tired and my eyes just playing tricks on me. That is, until B asks me if I'm seeing the shadows moving. I ask him, yeah, you're seeing this too, huh? I go into the yard at this point and look up into Frank's bedroom window. There's a lamp on, giving off just enough light to see the bedroom door and the dresser. I look at it for a minute when I see something. I say to B, dude, there's something in the bedroom. He replies with, it's just the dog. No, it's not. It's, it's not a dog. It's... It's kind of black and the black creature comes into full view of the window at this point. It looked like it was just made out of oil. Not quite solid but not translucent either. It moved from the window to the dresser to the door and then just disappeared. What the fuck are you talking about? 
B asks, still on the porch. Uh, I don't know, man. I don't know what it was, but, uh, I don't even know if I saw anything. It may have just been my eyes fucking with me. I walked back up the steps onto the porch and noticed an old mirror that had been left by the door. I remembered hearing stories about people using mirrors to see ghosts, so I figured why not. B had gone into the yard to try and see what was in the bedroom at this point too. I stare into the mirror for a few minutes when I see a, a black oily ball floating down one of the pillars behind me. Uh, dude, there's, there's something floating. Uh, it looks like a, a little ball of... I said. The ball disappeared out of view of the mirror and reappeared behind me, huge this time, and black. A translucent black oil behind my reflection. I couldn't see the yard anymore, and I couldn't see B, and for a moment, all I could see was me, the porch, and this thing coming behind me. And then, I felt it. Fingers made of ice entered into my shoulders and pulled me backwards. It's an impossible feeling to describe, but every time I think about it, I can kind of feel it. I bolt away from the mirror and I say something just went through me. Something, that black thing, it grabbed me and it pulled me backwards. I was done at this point and B was freaked too. So we hustled over to the gas station down the street to call AJ from the payphone and have her and C get my keys and shit and just get the hell out of that house. AJ asks us, where are you guys? And we heard you guys walk up the stairs but you never came in. I say, I'll explain later, just grab my keys and CDs and meet us outside. Back at the cars, I told them what happened and what I saw and I don't know if they believed me or not, but all I knew was that I was terrified. After that incident too, I never went back to that house and B moved out a short time later. Oh, and uh, if you're interested, uh... You can do a YouTube search for The Boy's Murder House and you can find news stories about the place there. Thanks for listening. So, to start, my boyfriend and I had just bought a house together. It's a lovely two-story home with a, an attic, a basement and a two-door garage as well and we got it for a steal, but... With that, we, we have no seller's agreement. But the owner has never seen the home, probably inherited it to be honest. By the way, we were in a pinch having been evicted from our apartment and taking care of foster pets. It narrowed our options as many renters around here don't allow pets. So, before I get to the main story, some backstory on us. I'm a 20 year old female and my boyfriend is a 30 year old male. I'm pretty skeptical about things like this too, but that doesn't mean I haven't seen some things personally that really do make me wonder. Those are stories for another day, but what I'm about to tell you is about something that I had always thought was a, an old wives' tale, but now I, I don't know anymore. Anyway, I'll call my boyfriend P for now. We also moved in with a good friend of mine and her boyfriend. They rent a room from us and it helps with the mortgage for sure. But they're three and four years younger than me and I'll call the girl M and her boyfriend E. Now, E and I had set up a, a man cave of sorts in the basement. We game and drink and basically just sort of do our nightly routines of getting some distance from our partners down there. Meanwhile, P and M set up workstations in the attic. More of a, a refined space for them for writing and tinkering with old typewriters and whatnot. We've been settling into the new house for a couple of months now, getting used to its pops and creaks, and it's an older house built in the 1920s, and my neighbours sort of uh, have mice on their side of the attic, so you can hear them skittering about and above your head. In this time, I've been noticing some small things that seem odd, though. The upstairs bathroom kind of gurgles, if that's the right way to say it, but only I've ever heard it. But when I asked P, M and E, none of them had heard the same noise. It was weird, but whatever. Downstairs, we, we also have another bathroom almost directly under the upstairs bathroom, just past the kitchen. Now, my cat uh, follows me everywhere in the house, squeaking at me to hold him and just generally being a cute cat, but 
he won't follow me into the bathroom without being coerced. He'll just sit there and kind of manically squeak at me until I usher him in. When he does finally decide to follow me in, he locks eyes with a, a portion of the hallway and won't break eye contact with it. And then he'll run to me while staying low to the ground. I know that this is a, a sign of fear, but he has no reason for it and I just can't explain it. And aside from that, he's recently started going into the bathroom by himself and just howling at the wall. It's weird, but cats, right? Now, he and I have our setup in the basement, which gives me the creeps to be honest. I wouldn't spend much time in it at all until I put a huge sheet of fabric along the walls that looks like a, a vertical striped wallpaper. Now, when I put this up, uh, I made sure to cover a doorway that leads to a small room under my front porch. Something about that room just bothers me and it feels like it's, um, it's watching you. In between the matches of the game that I play, the sudden realization that I have that feeling again always comes upon me too. And every time it's always that same room. It has no door and I occasionally still feel it despite covering it. My cat avoids it too. But just last week, he told me about an event that he went through while I was sitting right next to him. We had both been gaming and had some time between matches and decided to shoot the shit and complain about shitty teammates. But the usual MOBA player bullshit, right? Anyway, he tells me later that during a chat, he had hallucinated his girlfriend M walking downstairs and into the basement with us, but when he turned to talk to her... She just wasn't there. I just kind of laughed it off as he spends a lot of time smoking and maybe he was just confused. But earlier tonight, while I was in the basement alone, I heard someone open the basement door and heard and saw M walk down the stairs and behind me towards a chair or a cigarette or something. But when I turned to her to talk to her, there was no one there. I immediately looked behind me, but there was no one in the room. I looked in the entire basement and even called for her, but nothing. Once I realized she wasn't there, my cat howled and just booked it right up the stairs. I sat confused for a few minutes and told my buddies that I'd been gaming with that I'd be AFK for a bit. I felt uh, almost lost, to be honest. I decided to text M though from the basement, but sure enough, she hadn't come down the stairs at all. She'd been up in her workroom for hours, which means that that whole time she was two full stories above me. So then, what did I just see? Or better yet, who did I just see? My father died in 2008 when I had just completed my high schooling and we were in enormous amounts of debt. I still am in poverty, but that story can be told another day. So, to continue my studies, uh, I needed to find work and for three years I sold picados on the street and taught little children maths. In 2012, I was recruited into an ISP in our small town to work the night shift. During the interview, I was particularly asked if I would feel scared to stay alone at night in the third story of the enormous building with one security guard in the ground floor. I was never comfortable, but I needed the job. Plus, being at a night shift, I could attend my college during the day and all that. So, I worked in that office between February of 2012 to August of 2013, and during this time, I, I never got curious to ask anyone why no one wanted to work at night. I heard, before me, that someone used to work at night, but he just left abruptly. My work was to pick calls from clients who would have problems with their internet connection and provide simple solutions. Anything complex, and I had to note down their names and address and pass the list to my senior via email, and technicians would take care of them during the next day. It was a simple job, and I wouldn't receive many calls, and so, by 11, I would just spread out a thick blanket on the floor and fall asleep with the receivers beside my head in case somebody phoned. June 2013, though, was the month that I found out why no one was ready to work at night. 
That night, the security guard with whom I had developed a very close friendship came to the third floor and asked me if he could sleep in my room as there were too many mosquitoes in the ground floor. Understand that he was supposed to stay awake, but he used to take advantage of my altitude and sleep every night and the whole building had no security camera. Anyway, we were both sleeping in the same room. The two receivers were on either sides of my head and the lights were turned off. I had locked the door loosely, keeping the lights on in the corridor. And at 3am, I woke up to a sound as if someone was walking with his feet dragging to the floor. It was a really strange sound and really loud too. I was facing the door and could see the light on the other side of the door through the thin gap between the floor and the door. I stayed down, staring directly at the gap, trying to understand what or who it was and as I waited, the, the sound got louder and louder and soon I, I saw feet of someone crossing my door. My heartbeat got faster but I thought that it must have been the security guard but... When I looked behind me, he was fast asleep. My blood froze at this and the sound started to get louder again and soon the feet appeared near my door. This time, instead of just crossing my door, it stopped there too and didn't move. I waited for whoever it was to move away, but he wouldn't. And then I, I did the stupidest thing. I thought it could be an intruder and instead of waking up the security guard quickly, I tiptoed to the door while the thing still stood there and pulled it open suddenly. And there was no one but a gust of wind hit my face, causing me to get goosebumps all over. I woke up the guard now and explained to him everything. He took out his torch and turned on all the lights and searched the whole building but couldn't find anyone. Finally, he, he came to me and said that it could be a demon. Well, after that, I, I couldn't sleep again. I dropped messages to those who worked here in the day explaining this shit too, and I reached the office the next day a little early to catch the others. This was when the story started to emerge too. But one explained to me that he had the night shift a few days, and he would always hear someone climbing up and down the stairs in the middle of the night. Another said that he saw a chair being moved around from one corner of the terrace to another by something that wasn't visible. And that was apparently why no one would like to work at night and stayed there for more than a year. I left the company in August after they gave me an increment of $3 after working for more than one year. They used to pay me $54 a month and yes, I know, the salary is scarier than the story but... I needed to grasp anything that I could find to complete my bachelor's degree. I used to attend college in the morning and teach from afternoon to twilight and then go to the office. The cost of education and staying alive plunged me into further debt from which I'm yet to recover completely. But they install cameras in the office these days and I sometimes wonder if they've been uh, able to capture anything. I have plans to upload my personal paranormal stories, including this one, to my newly opened channel, Many Realities, someday, where I share strange but real stories of people around the world that defy explanation. I'd love to see you there, but that was my story, and man, it was weird. My parents divorced when I was really young. I do remember after the divorce that they both lived in apartments in the middle of Tennessee. Well, not long before I was to start kindergarten, my mum remarried to my stepdad and we moved to a small house in the middle of nowhere, Alabama. About uh, 30 miles outside of Birmingham. It was in a good school district and near my stepdad's family who would be helping with my brand new little sister. This was... Actually, a, a really exciting time for my other little sister and me, and we finally had cousins, aunts and uncles and grandparents that we would get to see all the time instead of traveling for the holidays to New England or Florida only once or twice a year. But we didn't even care that they were all step-family, we were just happy to be around other people. But the cousins that we saw most were Brady and Micah. Their mum and our mum worked odd jobs to make ends meet and helped each other out with childcare while my stepdad worked as a truck driver and Uncle Randy worked as an EMT ambulance driver. So our house was a, an odd setup. 
but we lived in a little two-room house that actually sat almost right behind a large old farmhouse that no one lived in. Whenever Brady and Micah would come and visit, we would always end up going through the house and always wondered why it was uh, still set up like a house since no one lived there. The beds in the bedrooms were made, uh, there were a couple of plates in the sink in the kitchen for the last few years, uh, it was like someone just left for work one day and never came home. So after a day of playing in the house, I found a plate in the kitchen that I thought was very pretty. I knew that we were about to go visit my grandparents in Florida for the summer and thought that it would be a perfect gift for my Southern Belle plate collecting grandmother. I took it back home and my mum helped me clean it and get it ready that evening before sending me off to bed. After my mum sent me to bed, she followed her nightly routine of smoking a cigarette, dumping the ashtray, sweeping off the porch before locking it, and then watching the nightly news before going to bed herself. While she was in bed, she kept smelling a, a burning cigarette, though. She couldn't figure out why, though, and even got up to check the garbage to make sure that her last one was not still lit. And it wasn't. So, she went back to bed. She's almost asleep, convinced that the smell is just stuck in her nose when all the lights in her room turn on. She turns to get out of bed and comes face to face with me, standing next to her bed, clutching my blanket and crying. She asks me why I turned on all the lights and I just break down crying and barely get the words out. I say that I didn't turn on any lights, not even the ones in our room or in the living room. Carolyn did it. I told her to stop and turn the lights back off, but she just laughed at me. My mum was really confused and asked who Carolyn was. I explained that Carolyn is my friend that I made. Normally, she just turns on some lights at night, and she didn't have lights in her house next door until she was six like me and likes to play with them. But when I tell her to stop and go home to sleep, she turns off the lights and walks away. But tonight, she turned on all the lights, and when I told her to stop, she laughed at me and walked into our closet instead of going home. And now, she doesn't want to leave, even though I want her to, and she made fun of me. My mum got out of bed and picked me up, and as she was carrying me back to my room, she quickly discovered that every light, I mean, every lamp, every ceiling light, even the pool chain lamp under the kitchen counter, they were all on. She took me to my room and laid me in bed and checked the closet just to make sure that Carolyn wasn't in there and turned off the bedroom lights so that my sisters wouldn't wake up. She went out into the hall and reached for the light switch, but before she could even touch it, every light in the house just went off. Mum was convinced that we had lost power, so she hit the light switch to check and the whole light came back on like normal. As odd as it was... She just put it down to faulty electrics and went back to bed. As she laid in bed, the cigarette smell came back though and she sat up trying to remember if she smelled it while dealing with me or if she was just uh, too preoccupied and freaked out to notice. While she was trying to remember, she heard the screen door to the back porch open and slam shut again. Of course, she knew that she had locked it before going to bed, so she wasted no more time and picked up the phone and called Uncle Randy since this was before the prevalence of cell phones and it wasn't like my stepdad would be able to make it from Arkansas back to Alabama in any time quick enough for the circumstances anyway. So, for 12 minutes, my mum just sat frozen in her bed, scared to move, listening for any other sign of an intruder or that of any of the three of us had woken up. Then she heard a car pull up into the driveway, followed by Randy banging on the screen door and yelling her name. She ran to the kitchen and threw open the back door, turned on the back porch light, and immediately saw it. Between her and Randy were about 20 burnt cigarette butts and cigarette ashes just strewn across the floor that she had just cleaned an hour before and a lock screen door. So, to start, uh, I need to give some background. I'm a male who lives in a, a relatively nice neighborhood. It's your average small town run of the mill suburbs area with a lot of people there. I'm a college kid who's home on break while my parents have gone away, which doesn't help at all. I also have a two-story house and I, uh, I don't have a gun or 
nor do I have any real weapons other than kitchen knives. I'm not on any medication, and I have no record of schizophrenia or any other mental illness. I barely have any relationships with my neighbours, most of whom are elderly, and the rest I have uh, minimal contact with. I don't have any people in my neighbourhood that I know of anyway who have any reason to attack or harm me too. So, uh, let's get into what's happening. About two nights ago, I, I woke up very late in the night and I went to the bathroom to go and take a dump. Now, my second story bathroom has a window that can see the entirety of my backyard. But directly behind it is a, a cul-de-sac which you can see directly into. There's a group of trees and a pile of rocks and mulch that divides it. Usually I can see everything in my back room without turning anything on because lights from my neighbor's house dimly light the room. And as I'm using the toilet, I, I look outside and I notice there's a a car park directly facing my house in the cul-de-sac. Now, if you've ever seen a cul-de-sac before, you would know that when you park, you always either park next to the curves or the sides of the street. This car was directly facing the curve behind my house, though. I thought that this was uh, pretty strange, considering whoever parked must have been there to visit someone. But if that were the case, then why would they not have parked in one of the driveways? The people who lived behind me were both elderly too, so they probably didn't have some big block party I didn't know about or anything, and even then, uh, only an idiot would park like that. As I stared into the car, I, I could distinguish a figure in the driver's seat, just sitting there. Since the lights were not on in my bathroom, whoever was in the car probably couldn't see me through that window. At this point, uh, I was determined to see who the fuck was in there, so... I went downstairs and got my binoculars from my dad's closet and went back to my bathroom to see who was there. Keep in mind that this is three in the fucking morning and I mean, uh, what person would be in their car just sitting there in the middle of the winter? Anyway, as I go into my bathroom, I, I looked outside to find nothing. The car had just since left. I thought it was a relief seeing as a I probably was just freaking out over nothing, and the person was just leaving whoever they were visiting or something. But then again, what are the odds that the moment that I notice the car, that's the moment that the person leaves? Either way, I, I finally calmed myself down and just uh, went back to sleep. The next day, a, a mix of boredom and paranoia got the better of me, and I decided it was time for some investigation. I go to my backyard cul-de-sac to see if there was any trace of the person who was there last night, and there was nothing. I go to my neighbours to see if they had anybody over the other night. Maybe it would just uh, clarify why the fuck somebody would be parked there in the first place. I asked both the owners of the two houses on the curves of the cul-de-sac, all of whom said that they didn't have any visitors, and I asked for the numbers, and I left. This is when my paranoia really started to kick in a bit. This was uh, a little messed up. I had no clue whether the person was coming back later and I can't call the police as they won't respond to a complaint that isn't even valid. So I decided to wait until later to see if the person came back. I spent that night just talking with my college friends about it over a video chat, all of whom thought I was either making it up or just freaking out over nothing. I sign off and watch Netflix until it's pretty late. The entire time, I, I just kept thinking about looking at my window to check, but since my friends had told me that I was worrying about nothing, and also since um, I'm a bit of a coward, I must admit, I just never checked. Finally, the clock tick 3.24am, the exact time I woke up the night before, and I thought, fuck it, I might as well check to be sure. And this is where I absolutely shit myself. The same exact car was parked and there was a man in a black hoodie and a ski mask standing right next to it, just staring at my house. I immediately ran to get my phone and dialed my neighbours, none of which answered, mind you. I ran back to the window, only to see that he was now standing in my fucking backyard. This was no longer a burglary attempt because if it was, he would be looking through my lower house windows trying to break in or something. 
this had to be some sort of stalker, I thought at this point. I decided fuck this and opened up my window and screamed at the top of my lungs, who the fuck are you? There was no response, so I yelled, I'm going to call the fucking police, get off my property. And finally, the man spoke. He said, have a nice day in like a, a cheery way that a cashier at the store would say when you're leaving. And the man waltzed, and I mean literally waltzed like a happy cartoon character, back to his car and, and just left. Well, obviously, I called the police department immediately. They asked me if I had any friends who were trying to play a prank on me, and I said no. And like I said, though, this town is relatively small, and the police did jack shit. They told me that if it happens again, to call them immediately. So, I'm shitting myself right now. It's currently 11pm, and God knows if we'll be back tonight. I'm going to be looking out my window all night, just waiting for him, and... I'll, uh, I'll keep you all in touch if anything happens. Wish me luck. Edit. 12.24am. So, I'm currently staring outside looking out my window, just waiting for the man to come, and I've informed my neighbours about his arrival, and they told me that they're also on the lookout. I must admit that uh, I feel pretty nervous, but at least I have my neighbours helping me out too, right? I just want this to be over to be honest 124 a.m nothing has shown up yet i got a call from my mum about a half an hour ago in fact uh, i haven't told them about any of the shit happening i just told her that i loved her and hung up on the phone my friends have been snapchatting me though asking me about this shit and i said that i'll try to get a picture if i can uh, if i do uh, i'll make sure that i send it to you guys too 1.34am. So, the neighbours said that uh, they see a car parked up the street from them. But one of my neighbours who's in his mid-40s says that he's going to go check it out. My foot is tapping the floor like crazy now. 1.37am. False alarm. Turns out it was uh, just the car of a family who just got home. Fuck me though. This suspense is making me feel ill. 1.48 a.m. One of the neighbors says that um, he's going to sleep for the night. Well, that's not good, but I just hope the rest of them hold out for me until the rest of the night. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fall asleep at all tonight. I mean, I've already chugged two cups of coffee and I'm as alert as possible. 2.11 a.m. Hey, uh, I was looking at my window when I heard something in the bushes of my backyard. I couldn't tell whether it was the guy, the wind, or just some stupid animal, so I shined and turned on the light in my backyard and saw nothing. I think, uh, I think yeah, his paranoia is starting to get to me. 2.17 a.m. Alright, it's official. I'm losing my shit here. I heard something crash in my kitchen and I ran down to see what was happening. Some pan had fallen off over from the shelf. Nothing notable, but it scared the absolute shit out of me. I went back upstairs to start looking out the window again at one of the streets right off my backyard, which is uh, about 200 yards away, I'd say. Through the trees, uh, I also saw a car at the corner flashing its brights repeatedly and then making a right, driving away from the street leading to my house. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but this. Is this guy taunting me? 2.40 a.m. Hey, so uh, I'm currently at my neighbor's house just staring into my backyard, the cul-de-sac. I walked out my back door and just sprinted and rang the doorbell as fast as possible. They saw me and opened the door immediately, luckily. It was uh, honestly the scariest shit that I've ever done. I was worried that he was going to pull up any second, in fact. But... And now I, uh, may just wait and hope for the best, I guess. 2.51 a.m. So, nothing out of the ordinary has happened, but I am dreading what will happen at 3.24, though. I saw two cars pass by my house, though. I couldn't tell if they were the same car as the one the stalker was using, though. Also, um, I couldn't tell if it was the same car just passing by both ways. 
Is this guy playing tricks on my mind? I'm ready to dial 911 at any second. I called my parents too and told them what was happening and they said that they'll be on their way home tomorrow. 3.01 a.m. Yeah, guys, uh, this guy's definitely coming. Uh, a car came up the street on the cul-de-sac and started flashing its high beams again and left. But he's definitely trying to fuck with my mind. Thank God I left the house, though, because the direction he's going is definitely coming back around to my house. Honestly, uh, I'm pretty scared, and I'm not even in the house anymore. At the moment I even see him outside his car, I'm definitely calling the police. 3.11am. So, my neighbour and I both agreed that we're going to leave the house and drive to the police station as soon as we see him park near my house. My heart is racing and I can't believe that I had just waited in my house alone for the past couple of hours. What the hell was I thinking? So, uh, it's... 3.20am now and still nothing yet. Even if he doesn't come though, I, I sure as hell am not going back. I'm not even sure if I'll, I'll stay here too. This is the scariest shit that has ever happened to me. 3.25am. Guys, someone is parked in my fucking driveway. I'm getting the fuck out of here right now. I'll try to update you guys on my mobile or later when they arrest this guy, but I'm leaving now. 1.15pm For those of you who are concerned, uh, I'm alive. Uh, I went to the police station and I've been questioned and they're working on finding the guy. But they haven't found him yet, unfortunately. And I went to a hotel and got some sleep and I just woke up. I'll share more with you guys soon, but right now I... Uh, I'm just taking some time to get this sorted out. Oh, and uh, thanks for the support, everyone. Hey, everyone. So, uh, for anyone who's been keeping up with all of this, uh, I'm alive and well, but far from safe. As my neighbor and I were waiting for the coast to be clear, I saw my garage door open at approximately 3.27 a.m. and right then my neighbor and I just booked it to his car. As we were leaving too I, I saw the light turn on in my bathroom and I nearly threw up realizing how easily he got in and how I'd just been a sitting duck an hour prior. I've been fantasizing over and over of how if I'd stayed in there my neighbors would have called me telling me that he was in my driveway and I would have heard my garage door opening and the dread just knowing that I was absolutely fucked. Once we were in the car, we sped off to the police station and the police gave me the usual rundown of questions in this type of situation, like whether I knew this man, when and where my first encounter with him was, and whether I could identify his car, or if I managed to write down his license plate. I told them that he had only come two times prior and that both times it was too dark to tell even with the street lights. But when the man had parked in my driveway, one of my neighbours who had still been on the lookout said that she saw the car was a, a grey Volkswagen with no licence plate. She went on to say though that she saw the man type in the coat of my garage, go inside and turn on each of my lights as though he was checking the whole house. The man had stayed there for five minutes according to her and proceeded to get back into his car without taking anything and just sped off down my street. She notified the police immediately and they've been searching for him since then. But nothing has come up and we returned to find that my house had been left uh, relatively unscathed. Oddly enough though, the, the police, they didn't even find a trace of DNA. Whoever this man was, he was meticulous as hell and Somehow, it gained the knowledge of what my garage code was. It makes me shiver to think that he may have been watching me even as I typed it in earlier in the week. And God only knows what other knowledge he has to track me down. But my parents have yet to still return home from their trip as their plane was delayed, so as of right now, I, I'm alone and still at the hotel with only a bottle of Jack Daniels to consult me. A couple of police cars have been stationed around the area of my house looking for the guy and they're all waiting upon his arrival. 
I'm not leaving this hotel until this fucker is caught, I'll tell you that much. And I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight. I'm hoping, though, that this is the night that he finally can't track me. The police have advised me to stop using any form of social media to be indicative of where I am. That means uh, no Snapchat, no Instagram, no Facebook, pretty much nothing. They told me that I can use my laptop as long as I remain as low profile as possible. This means that all I can do is wait for the police to call me and tell me that the stalker has been caught. For now, uh, I'm just going to try and figure out who this guy is and why he, uh, he might be trying to stalk me. I have a few theories as to who it could be. My first is my ninth grade Italian teacher. So, I went to a private school and this teacher had basically been one of the biggest lunatics that I had ever met in a schooling system. He was very outspoken in the way that he described politics and very mean-spirited during his time teaching. He would always make fun of students, had sometimes fallen asleep in class, and would always make perverted comments towards girls I knew. So, one day I, I decided to write an email to the dean asking him to please fire the man from his teaching position and explaining the unacceptable behaviour he had while working, that is. It worked, and I, uh, I never saw the man again. Now, the reason that I think it could be a possibility is because... He never particularly liked me in the first place. In fact, uh, I feel as though he kind of singled me out in a, a lot of instances and picked on me. I don't know if he ever found out that I sent the email, but if he did, uh, I'm extremely worried. I can't tell if it was him or not when he spoke in my backyard, though, as I was in full adrenaline mode while I was screaming at him. I would say, though, that this is not a likely suspect, but... I'm just not sure. My second theory is my Christian deacon from back in the second grade. I used to be a part of his church program a while back when I was in elementary school. Out of all the head figures there, one that always stood out to me was Deacon Anthony. He was a middle-aged man, very soft-spoken, and he had always been very particularly nice to me and my friend Kevin too. He would often bring us candy, uh, talk to us about our home life, and that treated us more fairly than the rest of the kids. But one day my friend Kevin had told me that Deacon Anthony had asked Kevin if he wanted to go home with him to hang out. But Kevin said no to him and told me and I told my parents about this and they had immediately contacted the church and told them about it too. And after that I never saw Deacon Anthony again. My parents told me later that they had contacted the board and he was removed from the church in fact. If this is the guy, though, he must have had a, a massive personality shift after that incident because the way the man happily told me to have a nice day did not match up with the one that he had when I was younger. Theory 3 is my classmate Derek from 8th grade. Derek was one of those insecure types who would always get off to making other people feel small. He was your standard 8th grade middle school shit eater who deserved nothing but a good ass whooping, which unfortunately never came. However, what did happen was I had started a rumour about him that I wish I didn't bring up, but it pretty much ruined his reputation and made him a laughing stock. He never found out that it was me as far as I could tell, but from what I heard from my hometown while I went off to public school is that at our local high school the rumour hadn't stopped and he turned into one of those quiet kids who just never talked. But keep in mind, this kid literally had told my whole friend group to stop hanging out with me. So, as far as I can tell, this revenge was extremely justified in my mind. This may in fact be the prime suspect, as he would most likely know where I live too. I tried finding any sort of social media about him, but nothing came up. This guy is pretty much a ghost, and I have no idea what he's been up to all these years. Theory 4 is uh, some complete stranger who I have no association with. Maybe this is just a, a genuine old school stalker who takes pride in picking out their prey from a, a random crowd. But no one I have seen in this town for the past week has seemed particularly odd, though. The only one that comes to mind, though, was this 
weird cashier at a 7-Eleven who seemed particularly in love with his job. He may have some form of, uh, of Asperger's syndrome, or just maybe he just takes pride in being a cashier, but he was always very polite with his customers, and when he'd been interacting with me at least. I'd gone in to get a soda from the fountain, and as the store was empty, he asked me, hey, is that all you're getting? And I said, yeah, this is all, and he continued with, oh, well, congratulations, it's free. I thought, well, sweet, a, a free soda, this guy's the shit, and I thanked him a ton as he was smoking a cigarette outside and said, have a good one, and left. Now, I know what all of you must be thinking. This is definitely the guy. He's a fucking cashier for crying out loud. Well, I'm just not sure. This guy was probably in his 30s, uh, seemed extremely grateful for his low-end job, and just seemed uh, content with what he had. He didn't strike me as a stalker, but then again, I, I haven't been back to the store since, so he may still be there, or he may not be there at all. I guess time will tell. I might stop by there tomorrow and uh, do a little more investigating. As we speak, it's 11pm uh, it's again and I'm staring at my hotel window just scrolling through Reddit. I'm still dreading the moment that I see the car with the flashing high beams pulling into the parking lot, so I'll probably just be looking out my window all night again. I'll post more updates if necessary and I, uh, I appreciate you guys, but uh, bye for now. So, uh, I've been reading through all your comments, guys, and just so you guys know, I, I can't get a hold of a gun as easily as most of you think. I live in a state where that shit just doesn't fly, and the best that I have right now is pepper spray and a baseball bat. 1.37 a.m. Call me a lunatic, but I left my room to get some fresh air, and I just couldn't stand being in this small-ass hotel room one more second. I was bugging out like crazy though and every person I saw seemed like a threat to me and I started talking with this one guy in the hotel lobby. He says he's been traveling from state to state on some sort of a self-indulged journey across the country or something. I asked him if he has any experiences with stalkers and he told me that he'd been receiving anonymous calls a couple of years back from uh, some guy. I asked if he had ever encountered one in his backyard or anything and he just uh, kind of looked at me funny. I explained to him the situation and he wished me the best of luck and it was nothing out of the ordinary but it was nice to have some real human interaction while I'm losing my fucking mind. 1.46 AM Alright, uh, one of the janitors must be fucking with me because I spent the last minute searching for my phone and asked someone outside my room to call it for me and I listened for the ringing and it's in the fucking safe. And the password is not the one that they gave me. What the fuck? This is... This is fucking weird, man, but... Whoever's doing this is going to get torn a new one, I'll tell you that much. I'm going to the manager right now, and... I've got to get this sorted. 2.08 a.m. So, I'm demanding a different room, guys. I'm not staying in that same fucking room one more second. The whole staff is in there now trying to figure out the safe password. Meanwhile, the manager is looking for the janitors who have been in my room to ask what the fuck they were thinking. <sighs> fuck this, though. I'm, I'm tired and I'm worried and now I, I just lost my fucking phone. Fuck. 2.24 a.m. No, guys. It's not the garage code, guys. I, I checked that. Even if it was, I mean, why would it be? And how would the fucking stalker even get into my hotel room, let alone rewire my safe? But guys, I'm, I'm not leaving the hotel, okay? I already paid the money to stay here, and I don't have any other place to go that's not a hundred miles away. I have no car, and I got here in an Uber car, and at least here there's uh, over a hundred people staying here, so that's good. I mean, the stalker's not going to come into a hotel full of people right? 2.40 a.m. I'm sitting in my hotel room all alone with no phone, no way to call an Uber, no way to call the police, and I'm starting to think that one of the janitors got bribed to do this or something. 
I now not only have no way of driving away from here, but I have no way of contacting any family or anyone for that matter of getting me away from the hotel. I'm going to wait for another 45 minutes and if they don't open the safe, I'm, I'm demanding that they call an Uber for me and I'm just driving the hell out of here. 2.53 a.m. Someone just knocked on the door saying the safe is open and I told them alright and then they asked me to come and get it. I asked him if he could slip it under the door but he said that I, I need to go and get it myself. I told him that I would in a couple of minutes and that he'd be waiting but I, uh, I'm starting to get a little bit paranoid here guys. 3.10 a.m. So the man said that my phone is in the main lobby if I want it and I'm on my laptop next to my window and I could have sworn out of the corner of my eye that I saw a car flashing its high beams again. I don't know if I should hold out till morning or get my phone and just leave. What do you guys think? 3.14 a.m. Guys, I, I'm not waiting until 3.24 for this guy to fucking come into my room and jump me. I'm packing and I'm just going to get the fuck out of here. I'll keep you guys posted on mobile when I get my phone back. 3.16 p.m. Alright guys, uh, I'm staying at a, a friend's place for right now. Uh, just to clarify when I said not a trace of DNA was found too, uh, I meant that there was nothing that was found to trace this guy back. Like uh, a glove or fingerprints on the garage keypad or anything. The police did not do a full investigation obviously. The guy still hasn't been found too and my neighbours have told me that no one's been back to my house and my parents are currently staying at my aunt's down south. I got my phone back too and there was a missed call from some guy named Nick Sullivan. What's strange is his name was never put into my contacts though. I've never met anybody named Nick Sullivan in my life and I uh, I don't know how it's in there. I tried calling back and it just went to voicemail. Creepy shit nonetheless but maybe I'm just uh, being a bit paranoid. I don't know. I'll see if I can make another update tonight but I gotta go for now. I'll talk to you soon. 4.35 p.m. So the guy who called my phone wasn't the same guy as Nick Sullivan that I'd missed a call from. I don't know what the hell is going on, but this is weird, man. Hey again, guys. So as I got in the Uber, the driver had been waiting for me to come out and I got in his car, right? I nearly shit myself as he turned on his car to find that the car, the one directly across from it, in the parking lot, was a, a grey Volkswagen. I couldn't tell if this was the same one from the night before because, well, A, uh, this one had a license plate, and B, uh, I never had gotten a, a good look at it up close before, so it could just be another person's car. As we were leaving, though, I, I looked up to the hotel, and in one of the rooms there was clearly a, a figure looking out the window. I'm not jumping to any conclusions right now as to whether it was him. I'm not sure if it was even the same room as mine. I just uh, keep questioning myself at this point as to whether all of this shit is real or just paranoia. But maybe the guy actually did find me and I was about to be slaughtered, maimed or worse. Or maybe this just is a, a classic case of schizophrenia or something and I'm just finding ways to freak myself out. One thing that is for sure though is that the guy is definitely still hunting me. I got a text from Mr. Sullivan or Nick or whatever the fuck he wants to call himself and I'm still petrified after seeing it. At exactly 8.34pm today he sent me a video and the only other thing that he said in the text was I see you. And the video uh, I'm positively sure is my house. And now I, I want to know when the video was taken. It probably was not taken last night as police were all watching my house. So that means that he either took it the first two nights or as recent as today. And I'm really hoping that it's the latter. If he took it today that means that he probably still thinks that I'm staying there. Unfortunately though this guy seems far from stupid and... If he has stalked me enough to know my garage code, 
he most certainly must have noticed that I'm no longer coming back there. By the way, he's trying to terrorize me and he's probably trying to get me to flee my house for his perfect moment to strike. In some twisted way, I, I expected worse, I guess. I don't know what makes this psychopath tick. Maybe dead animals, maybe dead people, or just seeing his victims crumble under all the stress that he's inflicted on them. But what I am dreading, though, is if he actually manages to find me at my friend's place. This guy, Tom, took up the mantle of protecting me, and if this guy manages to find me, I'll, I'll never forgive myself for putting this on him. I offered him money, but he refused. So... For the past two hours, we've uh, just been doing nothing but drinking beer and playing video games to calm my nerves. But Tom is a, a bit of a hick, I would say. He loves dipping, sitting on his front porch drinking beer, and he has a pretty large collection of guns. Probably the best friend to have in a situation like this, if I'm being honest. Just as you guys have been nagging me to get a hold of, too. So, all in all right now, I'm feeling the most secure I've felt out of all the days since this shit started. I have informed the police about my situation too in the video and they told me that they hadn't seen a car parked near my house at all in the past day. I gave them the number and they told me that they'll do their best to try and triangulate its position. So it's getting late now too and my friend and I have decided that we need to start securing the place in case of intruders. His house has security alarms and he lives on a relatively busy street so no one could just park near the house without parking in the driveway. and. He's been staying off of uh, official media as I've asked him to for my own safety. The anxiety hasn't stopped, mind you, but this is the first time I've had a friend by my side to help me with this situation, so I must admit that I feel better. He gave me one of his pistols too, and we started shooting in the range in his backyard despite having never shot a gun before. But we're currently on his porch, just talking as I, I share this. I'm really grateful for all of your support, and updates will come as always for everybody. I hope you guys have a good night, and hopefully uh, nothing notable will happen for once. And now, I, I guess we wait. Hey guys, so uh, at approximately 3 in the morning last night, my friend woke me up telling me that I needed to check something out. I immediately grabbed the revolver I'd left on the table next to the couch and we went to the front porch. In the distance, we could see a car parked all the way down the road. I'd say it was about 300 yards and still visible because of a street light. The following was the conversation that I can best remember from me talking to Tom. Yeah, you, you see that car down there? I was dozing off and... The moment I snapped out of it, the thing just showed up out of nowhere, and it was just sitting there. How long do you think it's been there for? Uh, I'm not sure. I saw it there and stared at it for a good two minutes. After that, I, I took my flashlight and started flashing it on and off. After the car shot off, and some guy got out and waved and walked into the woods. There's a wooded area near my buddy's house that if you walk through it, you can go walk into a large open field in his backyard. There's a fence dividing the field from the backyard, but it can be easily hopped. Well, do you think we should go and check it out? Nah, this guy could be going into the woods and coming back around towards my back door. You have to stay here and I'll go check it out, okay? Alright, but uh, if it's a grey Volkswagen, we need to leave, okay? I want you to record the license plate too and look inside for anything notable. Look for things like uh, ropes and knives and duct tape. Uh, anything sketchy that we need to get out of here, okay? Yeah, okay, well, just wait inside and defend the house or something, alright? Make sure no one gets inside, okay? I went back into the house and stared out the window as Tom approached the vehicle with his 12 gauge. I went to the back of his house and stared out his backyard window and I saw some figure start walking across the field. This was particularly strange as there were no houses visible in this field and he just seemed like he was walking towards nowhere. He climbed over a hill and he was no longer in view from the window. I went back to the front window to look at the car and Tom was checking it out. 
I felt relieved for the slightest moment as I felt like uh, maybe, just maybe, I was overreacting. And then his home phone rang. I looked at it and saw the caller ID and it was my area code, not Tom's. At this point, I had my phone still on airplane mode so I assumed it was someone from my neighborhood or family trying to contact me. I felt uh, almost intrusive seeing that I was answering a call to a home that was not even mine, but now was not a time to take chances, so I answered. Hello? Uh, excuse me, who's this? Oh, uh, excuse me sir, my apologies, uh, is this the owner of the household? Uh, no, uh, I'm just a friend of the owner, he's currently outside, uh, who's this? At this point... I just felt that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when you realized that you fucked up. I just revealed that I'm here alone and whoever is calling just realized that too. Uh, hello? Who else are you with, sir? Is it just you? At this point, I was shaking and I could barely speak without stumbling my words. I decided the best thing to do was lie like no tomorrow. Uh, no, uh, we're having a party and there's a couple of other people here. Uh, who's calling? Are you sure about that? I was just walking by and saw that there were only two cars in his driveway. At this point, I completely lose my shit. <sighs> Listen, man, just fucking tell me who you are and why the fuck you're calling this house so late. Hello? <sighs> Can you please just fucking tell me? I apologize, sir. I may have the wrong number. But tell whoever owns this house to call back. Thank you. And then he hung up. But Tom had come back and said that the car was not a Volkswagen and had a license plate. He said that the windows were tinted and the doors were locked, so there was really nothing that he could make out. I told him about the caller and he said that he had no idea whose number that was. He called back and no one answered. He also called from a restricted number, but there was no answer there either. An hour passed by as we were sitting on the porch and we heard an audible slam from his back door. We both looked at each other and he motioned to follow him around back. We saw nothing out of the ordinary and we looked around everywhere for footprints, but still nothing. But when we had gone back to the front porch after countless minutes of searching, it was approximately four in the morning at that point. It wasn't until 10 minutes after we got back to the porch that we noticed the car 300 yards away was gone and we hadn't even noticed. I haven't gotten any sleep since last night and I told him that I wanted to leave his house because I need to keep moving and he said that he wants to come too. He locked up all his doors, brought some guns and we drove off at 6 in the morning. The police still haven't done jack shit mind you despite all the valuable intelligence I gave them too and I've been on the road all day with my friend now. I drove a lot and he slept in back and we're currently at a McDonald's as I type this. We were joking saying that if we do end up getting kidnapped and murdered and attacked at least someone will know from these videos right? I'm I'm just tired guys. Tired of all of this shit and of being stalked tired of being hunted down and tired of making these fucking posts I just I want this to be over if anything happens tonight uh, I'll let you know but bye for now I'm uh, sorry to inform you guys but I think it's about time that we wrap up the show. My parents have returned home and both the police and my neighbours haven't seen the man ever since I left. I've been on the road for the past few days and I just, uh, I want to stop running. My parents informed me too that they got a hold of a revolver now and all I want to do is just go home, sleep in my own bed and be done with this madness. I'm starting to think that all of this here has just been uh, in my head. I mean, 
The guy hasn't made any notable appearances in my life since that night, and maybe that video that he sent was just from the first two nights that I saw him. I don't know. I guess that's been the real problem ever since the start of this, is that I've just been overreacting to this whole phenomenon, maybe. Maybe this guy is just some deranged burglar. Maybe he came into my house thinking that I was just somebody else. I don't know for sure. But Tom and I have been on and off the road, only stopping to get food or to piss, and a lot of comments have been telling me to either stop using Reddit or to stake it out and confront the man myself. I've come to realise that I've been making a poor choice documenting everything that's happened on Reddit. God only knows if this man has been using it to his advantage. But more importantly, I've, I've been hiding and running away from him all this time. And I thought it was finally time that I confront him myself. Now, I'm not going to make an effort to contact him or find him, but if he decides that he wants to come and attack my house and my family and myself, then uh, he'll finally meet his maker, that's for sure. However, I thought a good start would be to just pay the 7-Eleven guy a visit today, and we decided to confront him. I just needed to be sure that it wasn't him, so... We parked in the front of the 7-Eleven at about um, 8 at night, about 3 hours ago. This is the conversation that we had, to the best of my memory. Hey, is, uh, is this the guy? Yeah, uh, that's him. Let's just go in and uh, ask him a few questions, okay? We just need to scare him a little and see how he responds. Tom took his pistol from the back seat and put it in his holster. Dude, uh, is that necessary? Look, man, we aren't even sure if this is the guy. I mean, we can't just pull a gun on him and make him shit himself. I'm just taking some precaution is all, and if this is the guy, then we got to be careful, right? And with that, Tom got out of his car and started walking in as I followed. As soon as we walked in, he asked, Hey, boys, how you doing today? We both gave him a stern look, so he responded, Hey guys, what's the sour mood for? I looked at Tom and he looked back at the cashier and asked, Lovely day, isn't it? I could see that the guy was getting visibly nervous and began to sweat a little. Hey man, uh, I couldn't but notice that gun in your holster. A pretty nice gun, uh, that's a Colt, right? My dad had one of those. But we didn't break eye contact. Yeah, I would say it's a pretty nice day isn't it? How's your day going? Well, I went directly in front of the counter and got face to face with him. Hey, uh, can I ask you something? I could see the cashier swallowing and he coughed. <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, sure. But what is it? Do you drive here to work by any chance? Oh, uh, <laughs> negatory. Uh, my friend drops me off. I looked at Tom and he looked back at the guy. You best not be lying to us, man. The cashier broke. Look, guys, uh, I don't want any trouble. If, if you're here to rob the place, that doesn't concern me, okay? I'm just a guy who works here, alright? Just take the money and go if that's what you want. We aren't here to rob anything, okay? Just asking a couple of questions if that's alright with you. Cashier folded his arms and said, Sure. Ask whatever you need. What's up? When does your shift end? Oh, uh, usually around three in the morning, I'd say. What's all this about, boys? Are you guys undercover cops or something? Have you seen a grey Volkswagen in the past couple of nights that you've been working here? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I did. Uh, the night before you came in here was a, a guy who came in after you the, the other night, I think. Did he buy anything? Uh, yeah, he bought some cigarettes, I think, and dipping tobacco. He didn't say much, but he said he had a long night ahead of him. I take it he gave you ID? Uh, yeah, he did, actually. What was his name? Do you remember? Uh, I think it was like Nathan Silverstein or something like that. You mean Nick Sullivan? Uh, shit, yeah, actually, um, I'm pretty sure that that's his name. What's it to you, by the way? Can we see your ID for a second? He showed us his ID, and this guy seemed to be completely innocent. 
Alright, man. Thanks for your time. Uh, the police might come later to ask for your camera feed from that night, but I appreciate your help. We left, and that was the end of it. Finally, after all these days of running, we finally got a decent lead on this guy. We called the police, and they're currently going over the tapes, and this was an amazing feeling now that we finally had a good lead on this guy. And I can, uh, I can finally go home. But Tom has been such a good friend the past couple of days. He's stuck with me through thick and thin, and even through rough times. And I'm just uh, eternally grateful for what he's done for me in this time of need. After a long day of traveling, he told me that his girlfriend has been awfully worried about him too, and this made me feel even worse about the situation. Finally, I told him that we needed to part ways and that I wanted him to go home and rest, and that I apologized for putting him in danger. He told me not to sweat it, and that it was actually a pretty exciting experience for him, despite it maybe putting our lives in jeopardy. I gave him some money to help him out with his troubles and he's going to his girlfriend's house and he said that he'll be staying there for a while until this gets completely sorted out. But no more running and no more fear and no more stalking. I'm finally done with this guys and I seriously can't wait to go home and see my family and just be safe and sound in my home again. I want to thank you guys for all your support through these past few days. It's really meant a lot. At some point I... I got texts from my parents too saying that it was safe to come home. But when I called them, everything sounded normal. However, my mum sounded somewhat worried and flustered about the whole situation when my dad put her on the phone. I asked her what was wrong and she simply told me I'm under a lot of stress and followed it by, just come home please, we miss you. I feel sorry for them if I'm being honest. I don't know why, but I somewhat blame myself for all this shit happening. If they haven't seen the stalker at all, then this must have to do with me and me alone. I must have done something to cause this man to torment my family. As we speak, Tom has left back home and I'm finishing this last update at Starbucks. I'll call an Uber and I'll finally be home. If the guy gets caught, I'll, I'll link you guys to a news article or something, but uh, this will be the final update. Thank you all in advance for your advice and enthusiasm and, uh, uh, peace, I guess. 12.12 a.m. So, uh, I just came home and there aren't any cars in the driveway. I'm a little worried and, uh, I'm gonna call my parents. Alright, uh, no answer from my parents. I guess I'll, I'll try the garage code now. Well, uh, my parents must have changed the garage code or something. Uh, I'm banging on the door and no one's fucking answering, though. And man, it's, it's really cold tonight. 12.21 a.m. Alright, well, uh, there's some lights turning on in my bedroom, so they're obviously home. This happened a few weeks ago and... I'm uh, still a bit shaken by it. So my husband and I, we like to take long drives in the desert with our dog. We live just outside of Las Vegas and are fortunate to live in a city with abundant and beautiful areas to stargaze or use a telescope. But my husband just got one for his birthday in October so he was excited to try it out and all that. But we drove our Kia up to a popular overlook and he took out the telescope. He showed me a bunch of constellations and we even saw a shooting star. But the doggo sat in the car too with the two windows rolled down at this time and uh, my dog is a, a bitch straight up. They weren't kidding when they named female dogs that too. She's a, an American cattle dog and she saved my ass before from a home invasion. She's protective of both me and her dad. Anyway, hubby had to pee and he told me to wait in the car for him. So I got in and locked the door and meanwhile I'm browsing Reddit when I hear a gravel moving and thinking it's my hubby, I remark, that was fast and suddenly my dog goes berserk. She's snarling, barking and so I turn around and there's a dude that's not my husband. The idiot made a huge mistake though. 
he put his hand through an open window with a crazy 63 pound dog. She's got his hand and so he's just screaming. I'm screaming and my husband is yelling as he runs towards us with his pants half on. The dog lets his arm go and the guy takes off and I call the cops. My husband tries chasing after the guy but he's 6'3 and 280 pounds and this guy was fast. Anyway, the cops do show up eventually and tell us that they'll look out for him but to maybe stay away from that area that night. The cops in our town are just a, an absolute joke. Anyway, the doggo got a cup of Dairy Queen that night and we're very grateful for her. When I was 13, I started modelling. I did fairly well, but honestly, I, I hated the business. They were just really strict about my weight. I mean, I couldn't get over 100 pounds or I'd lose my contracts. I couldn't dye my hair or have any piercings without permission, and they would often check on me to make sure that I haven't gone against their wishes. But fast forward two years, though, to me being 15. But one day, I got an email from a fitness photographer. But this wasn't uncommon for me to get random emails because my agency would give my email out once they booked me something. But this is also about 12 years ago and back then I, I naively didn't worry too much about anything really. You know, the, the common teenage mentality of nothing's ever going to get me. In the email, the photographer told me that he'd like to do a shoot and the compensation that he promised me, I would have made more money than I have of any other shoots. So, obviously, being money driven, I emailed him back and told him yes, I'd be interested and he sent me one back after that saying that he needed some uh, sample photos of my calves and my feet and my backside and my breasts to make sure that I had the physique he wanted. I was a little cautious, I must admit, but I thought, you know, He's offering me a lot of money and I should probably do what he's asking or he's going to find somebody else. And that's exactly what he wanted. He wanted me to feel pressured to send him the pictures and I, uh, I did feel the pressure. Of course, I had it in the back of my mind that I shouldn't do it, but the money was real good. So... I sent the pictures clothed and he said that he couldn't tell my proper sizing and I need to send him nude photos. Obviously, I declined this and told him that I'd be willing to set up a meeting and his assistant can take measurements but I would not send nude photos over the internet. He set up a meeting but cancelled last minute and a few weeks later he was on the news. He apparently got busted for child pornography and Shocker, he was not a fitness photographer. Who knows what could have happened to me had I actually gone to meet him, though. I never found out how he even got my email, in fact, because my agency said that they never spoke with the guy. This happened about uh, four years ago, around New Year's at my house. So... I live in a, a pretty wooded area of Maryland. I actually have a nice trail in my backyard that leads to a stream too. I go down there a lot with friends and my dog and even just by myself sometimes. I've never encountered another person along this stream any time that I've been there. But because of this, I've uh, always felt pretty at ease there, but it's still a bit cautious knowing that my whole neighborhood could just as easily walk down their backyards and get to the stream too, or people from the neighborhood against ours. On this day, we had some cousins over, I believe, to watch a Ravens game and just to get together for the holidays and whatnot. It was unusually warm for late December, probably around 50s or 60s, and we all moved outside to supervise my little cousins throwing a football around. My mum suggested that I take my younger cousins down the trail to the stream to burn off some energy. Honestly, I didn't want to because I was bloated from food, but I did anyway. So, I herded four pubescent boys down the trail to the stream and they kind of ran off ahead of me to climb on things and just do whatever. 
I just hung behind, just watching over them and made sure nobody did anything especially stupid while playing on my phone. As I was playing on my phone, I, I got this kind of weird feeling while I was down there, and I just didn't feel at ease, almost like a, a premonition or something. I turned around to look behind me and scan the woods and for the first scan, everything was fine. But then, I saw it. There was a dark figure in the distance that looked male, but I'm not entirely sure because of the distance, who was half behind a tree, almost as if he was hiding and peeking out at me. When I spotted him, rather than go back behind the tree, he stepped out and just stood beside the tree while... I stared back. I had a just a really bad feeling about this and I got really big chills and immediately yelled for the boys to come back. But they didn't listen to me at first but I told them to get their asses back now and I didn't say why. Just start hauling ass up the trail and we made it back safely to my house where I told everyone about the encounter. I'm not sure if nothing bad would have happened if we had stayed down there but I, uh, I really didn't want to stick around to find out. This happened when I was in my early teens in the late 80s. My family lived in a, a very secluded area, a forested area in fact. We had a long driveway and our small home sat on a square acre of mowed grass with woods on both sides. I was... Alone one night, just talking with a buddy from school, and I often rode my bike to town over the summer, and he invited me to come over and spend the night. It was a 20 mile trip over completely empty country roads, but it was always an adventure, and I seldom hesitated to go when I had a place to stay. And so I, I told him it was a sure thing. I'd call my mother at work and then start my ride. But here's where it got creepy. Once I hung up the phone and started getting dressed, more black, I picked up the phone again to call my mum, but the line was dead. But this had never happened before and it was a sturdy rotary phone and we never had problems with it. But for some reason my, my thoughts just instantly went to the small phone box in the back of the house. It was a, a tiny round junction with nothing but a rubber covering behind the cover was the exposed connection between the phone pole and our inside line. But the wires were twisted together and kept out completely vulnerable. I remember questioning why I would even think about that. Why would I jump to conclusions about the cause of the dead line? But for some reason I was just overwhelmed with a feeling of dread that just didn't make sense and I was wrestling with my thoughts. I decided to behave as though I was in real danger but calm myself by focusing on how unlikely it was and how my imagination was probably just getting the best of me. But I just could not shake the feeling that I was in trouble for some reason. So I finished dressing and strapped a buck knife to my hip, the old Rambo knives with a compass in the stock and it was cheap but really big and I moved quietly and planned how I would leave the house. I remember this really well actually. I would slide out the front door and pull it closed behind me, locked, and I would not be able to get back in. I would grab my bike from against the wall on the enclosed porch and spin around and use my elbow to press the button of the handle on the screen door and jump down the concrete steps. I'd hop on my bike and speed down the drive. And so, with the plan in mind, I got to it. It was really dark outside, but there were bright lights in the front and the rear of the house that created big pools in the yard, and that's all the light that I had. I executed my maneuver just as I planned, but unfortunately, my elbow slipped off the button on the handle and banged into the door as it opened, and within seconds, I was pumping down the gravel drive. I turned my head to the left, filling my ears with the roar of the air I was cutting through and stopped pedaling my eyes fixed on the rear of the house. Again, I'm not really sure why, but I was 100% sure that someone was coming. I don't know how or why I was thinking this. It was only a moment, but I didn't look away despite my own skepticism. And at the last instant, I saw him. 
A man, wearing dark clothes and a ski mask, came tearing out of the lit yard around the back of the house and plunged into the deep shadow along the side, heading for the front, where I had been only seconds ago. I was invisible wearing black from head to toe, and instead of running straight for me, he went for the porch where the commotion I just made had come from. I turned forward and leaned into the pedals. I could barely see the driveway, but I had ridden my bike down it many times at night, and I could make out the large stone gatepost before the dirt road. I almost wrecked turning the corner, but recovered and sped it away. About a mile further, I finally stopped at the intersection to a paved road. My heart was pounding in my chest and my forehead was sweaty. I stood there for a bit and got my breathing under control while I tried to digest what had just happened. My thoughts were racing because I knew damn well what I just saw, but I was finally out of danger and all I could do was press on. My neighbours were Amish, so they had no phone, and I wouldn't have known what to say anyway. But when I got to my friend's house much later, I told him what happened and called my mother. She listened and didn't give me a hard time, but I could tell that she didn't know what to think. She wouldn't be home till morning anyway, and she said that she'd be careful. And that was it. I had heard a laughter once from the edge of the woods and things in the yard that had been moved on occasion, but no one else had these experiences and I assumed it was just backwards Amish kids fooling around or something. Nothing had ever really happened before, but I doubt Amish kids would know how to disconnect a phone line though. Whatever happened and whatever all these uh, strange occurrences came from, I think that there was something more sinister going on. So this all began when I was 19 and continued for several years after that. My mail, which I suppose matters to the story. When I was in high school and my first year of college, I worked at a local grocery store part-time. I did everything from bagging groceries, stocking shelves, cashiering, working for the service desk, all that stuff. But toward the end of my time there, I was doing more of the stuff in front of the store, mainly at the service desk since I had been there forever, more cashiering. It was a small little grocery store too, so we'd have regulars. Many of the same customers would come in a lot, in fact, and we'd talk with them and get to know them. I was also very young and naive at the time, and thus overly trusting. And that would prove to be to my detriment. But there was this one guy who would come in about once a week, sometimes twice, and I'd been his cashier a few times. Eventually, he started standing in my line even if other lines were shorter, which wasn't too unusual, I guess. I hated working in retail, but I was damn good with the customers and was well-liked. The only odd thing, though, was that generally the people who would do this were older, the 60s or 70s at least, I'd say, and were usually ladies, whereas this was a guy who had to be uh, at most in his 40s. But whatever, I, I didn't think much of it at the time. His name was Jeff, but I didn't know his name for a long time because he always paid with cash. But when I finally learned what it was... It was in one of those worst ways that you can think of. We'll get to that, though. At first, though, Jeff seemed pretty much harmless. He would chat me up, and if I didn't have a line, uh, we'd sometimes talk a bit. He seemed interested in me and my life, but again, this wasn't uh, so unusual apart from his age, mostly. So I just went with it. Jeff would ask me things about myself, like innocent questions. So I thought at the time, anyway. He'd ask me what college I went to, and I told him because I had no reason not to. At one point, he brought up cars too, and he asked which one was mine. The parking lot was clearly visible through the large windows at the front of the store, and I stupidly pointed up at my car and said, it's that one. But we lived in a small area, and a lot of times by talking with customers, we'd realize that we lived near each other or something like that. So... I didn't think much of it when he asked me where I lived. I told him the name of the town, which was adjacent to the city the store was in, and then 
When he asked where in that town I lived, I told him my street and then described my house. Like a total idiot, mind you. I like to think that I'm a smart guy in most situations, but that was not the case in this one. I didn't realize it at the time, but Jeff was systematically gathering information about me. But by the time I realized what was happening, it was way too late. I had told him everything short of giving him my cell phone number or actual address. So one day I was working in the service desk when Jeff came in and he wanted me to ring his groceries up. However, I was busy selling lottery or money order to a customer or something, I can't remember, so I told him that I couldn't. And he got this look on his face like he didn't like the fact that I told him no, but it was just for a second and then he was smiley again. I didn't really talk to him much because, you know, I was with another customer and Jeff just stood there staring at me. I didn't really notice at first because whatever machine I was using, lottery or money order again, I can't remember, it was giving me hell. Eventually, even the customer was like, hey, that guy keeps staring at you and that's when I looked over at him. He wasn't smiling but looked kind of angry instead but at the moment I looked at him, the, the smile was back on his face. Then Jeff said something about me wearing a skirt. Now, this wasn't the kind of humor he had exhibited before, and it was uh, totally out of nowhere, mind you, and it just kind of gave me pause. I just kind of looked back at him as he went on about how I'd look in a skirt or dress, just staring at him with a total what-the-fuck expression on my face. And... The more he talked about it, the more unnerved I became. Another co-worker, Miranda, was in the service center with me and she and the customer as well as another nearby cashier were all giving him a, what I presume were the same identical what the hell is happening expressions. He wasn't stopping though so I realized that I had to say something to just make him stop and I couldn't even pretend to be humored by it when I told him, I don't know what you're talking about, you'll never see me in anything but this uniform. My tone was serious and he knew that I wasn't amused. The smile was gone and I saw something on his face that I had never seen before. It was anger, yes, but it was also humiliation and he did not like it one bit. He glared at me with a look that honestly I felt to my bones but rushed through me like a cold chill. My breath caught in my throat as we just stared at each other and I didn't even know how to explain it other than to say that this was the most menacing way anyone has ever looked at me. But with that look he was saying you'll be sorry, I'm sure of it. Maybe I wasn't sure at the time but in hindsight and all that. And without another word he just turned and walked away. After that, whenever Jeff would come into the store... He never stood in my line again, which was fine with me to be honest. However, he would always loudly talk about me from other registers and glare at me. He would badmouth me, but not in such an overt way where we could really do much about it. Sometimes he wouldn't even refer to me by name, but we all knew who he was talking about. Sometimes at night, I would be the only cashier at the front as we approached closing time. Another would be in the office just counting the drawers for the day while the manager and the other workers were usually in the back or throughout the store stocking shelves or cleaning. And in the evenings when I was more or less alone, I would notice this same car pull into the parking lot but the driver never came in. But the main defining feature of this car was the fact that one of the headlights was burnt out. Because of the previously mentioned large windows, anyone in the parking lot could look into the store right at me too. It took me longer than I'm proud of to realize what was happening here and the only way I realized who was in the car was by chance. My car was in the shop so my mum picked me up from work when I was done one day and as I was waiting for her to get there outside in front of the building, I was able to see into the car away from the bright lights of the store. And sure enough, it was Jeff. My shock was palpable and that was when I truly realized that Something was just very, very wrong about all this. 
I actually backed away in fear at this point and kept imagining what I would do if he got out of the car. The door inside had locked behind me and while there were people in the store still, they weren't in the front. But luckily, that was when my mum got there. I didn't tell her because my story would only worry her, so I just kind of uh, let it go for the time being. But everyone at the store knew about Jeff before long and it got so bad that when he would come inside, everyone would instantly tell me to go into the back and they would page me overhead when he left. I mean, everyone, even the managers. We all knew and we were all pretty creeped out. A lot of the times that he would come in and when he didn't see me, he would just immediately leave again too, or so I was told. I remember once we didn't notice him walking in though and by the time that we realized he was almost to the doors. Another cashier, Laura, saw him and looked scared. Now, Laura wasn't the, uh, the easily rattled type, but this guy had all of us on edge, mostly because they were afraid of his weird fascination with me. She urged me frantically to hurry and get in the back, and I hadn't noticed him just yet and was confused, and I started to ask her why, but before I could finish, she said, just go. I clearly remember this moment too, these few seconds between the time that she said that and the time that I saw him walking through the door when I realized what was happening. Jeff saw me before I rushed into the back and I was so unnerved that I locked the back door of the loading dock, worried that he'd come looking for me back there. When he was gone, Laura called me back up and she just couldn't even say anything. She told me that he gave her a furious look and then stormed out of the store and I remember being worried that he would retaliate against her. Luckily, he never did though. Things would get worse though. I began seeing Jeff around town, like when I would go to the movies, to various stores, gas stations, the mall and even the bank ones. Just a couple of these times might be a coincidence, I admit, but this was happening a lot. Plus, it was Jeff, so I knew it was much more than that. But I had no proof that he was stalking me at this point and still didn't tell my parents. At the time, I was in college and I lived at home and commuted to school and I would often be there until after dark. By this point, it was winter too and got dark early. There were times when I would pull out of the school parking lot and very shortly after that... I'd see a car behind me with just one headlight. Once or twice, again, could just be a weird coincidence, but this was happening probably once a week at this point. And I still didn't tell my parents, even though I was pretty sure it was him. Then one night, when I was walking out of school into the naturally dark and deserted parking lot, I saw a car parked in an empty part of it with the headlights off. I didn't think anything of it until the lights came on and there was only one headlight again. I knew immediately that it was him and I sprinted to my car, threw my shit into it and got the hell out of there. After that too, I, I started walking out with either security guards or friends when I could and a couple of times I, I thought I saw his car but he never put his lights on unless I was alone. He would never approach me or drive toward me or anything during these times too. It was a, uh, it was like he was taunting me or something. It was like he just wanted me to know that he was there, that he knew how to find me or something. This continued even after I quit working at the store. I became a tutor at school instead, but his stalking, because that's what it was, and I knew that for sure now, didn't cease. On one occasion, I was at a friend's house after dark and then I drove home, but I was almost there when I realized that I had forgotten something. Instead of pulling around and into the driveway, I was going to just loop around the street because it was easier, so I drove past my house. This particular night, I was home alone, both my siblings lived elsewhere and my parents were out, so the house was dark. But there shouldn't have been anyone in the driveway because... I'd just spoken to my parents and they were nowhere near my home. But when I drove by, I, I saw the dark shape of a car and taillights. Sometimes people turn around in our driveway because it was so big, so I thought that maybe that was it or maybe someone had car trouble or something. 
But then, the car pulled out of the driveway after me and I looked in my rearview mirror and saw it. The car had only one headlight. Which means that this fucker was at my house and had been waiting for me. He followed me for a while too and I couldn't go home and I also didn't want to lead him to my friend's houses so I drove back to the store I used to work at, rushed inside and looked out the windows to see if he followed me. Miranda was working the night and asked me what was going on and I just couldn't even speak. All I could do was look at her and she knew. Her eyes got wide and she couldn't speak either. After that night, Jeff began following me more too. He'd be at my school more often and it was like he just knew my schedule. He knew where I'd be and when I'd be there and I saw him all the time and I shudder thinking about the times that I didn't see him but when he had been there for who knows how long. And it wasn't just my schedule he'd learned but he knew my parents to an extent too. At least when I would be home alone and all that. A few times, I'd hear a car pull into the driveway at night and I just knew that it was him, even before I looked. But he never got out of his car, that I could see at least, and he would only stay for 10 minutes or so. But mainly this would be on a Wednesday or Sunday night too when my parents would be at church and I began avoiding the house at these times, either staying at school to study or hanging out with friends or going to the movies or something. At the time, I would occasionally babysit for someone at my parents' church too, but during this time, I, I eventually stopped, afraid that he would follow me there. It was at this point too that I decided that I needed to look into this guy. Now, at the time, I, I didn't even know this guy's name, but something told me to take a look at the sex offender's database. So one day, while at my friend Jill's house, I did that. We looked at various pictures of nearby sex offenders and discovered the most shocking amount of them in the vicinity. And eventually, one of the small thumbnail pictures caught my eye. It was hard to tell if it was him, so I clicked on it to bring up a larger picture and more information about the guy. Jill's internet was crap, so the page loaded slowly. And his name came up first. It was Jeff. Jill and I waited for the picture to load and as it slowly came into view, I literally stopped breathing for a second because it was him. That's how I learned his name and that's how I learned that the man who was stalking me was actually a sexual predator. I didn't know what to do with this information because I mean, thus far he, he hadn't done anything illegal per se, but I knew at this point that I needed to tell my parents. So I, I told them everything and they were shocked to say the least. They uh, honestly had had no idea. Jeff was really good at hiding his activities, which makes me think that he wasn't just not very stealthy with me, that I didn't catch him so often because he sucked at being subtle or anything. No, Jeff wanted me to know that I was being watched that I was the object of his obsession. So I, I told them everything. My dad was really angry. Like, I swear if he knew where Jeff was, he would have gone to threaten him to leave me alone or something. But my mum was just scared. Like, really scared. She even cried a little bit. We briefly discussed calling the police, but again, Jeff hadn't actually broken the law other than maybe trespassing on our property, but... I couldn't prove it was him or anything. All we could do was be vigilant. I thought I would feel better when they knew, but to be honest, I, I just felt worse. However, they needed to know, and everyone in my life needed to know for that fact, and so uh, I told them. We started taking precautions, and by this point, I was in my 30s, but I felt like a child. I didn't have a curfew per se, but... Uh, my parents were hesitant to leave me alone even during the day. My dad is normally not easily rattled, which is why it was so unnerving to see him so shaken up by this. We started keeping the cats inside too, and when the dogs were out, we, we wouldn't let them out of our sight. More than a few times, I remember sitting on the back steps after letting them out to keep an eye on them and just feeling like I was being watched. 
But by this point, I, I never felt comfortable, and never felt safe, so it might have just been my paranoia, but I don't know. I, my mum got me pepper spray, though, and I would carry it with me at all times and when I was out of the house, too. And at night, I, I even started taking a knife to bed. Jeff, uh, Jeff didn't stop, though. I remember one time I was at a friend's apartment and while she was in the bathroom, my front door started rattling like someone was trying to open it. Luckily it was locked and before she even got out of the bathroom it had stopped. I didn't tell her at first because, well, she wouldn't be spending the night there so she wouldn't be alone. After that I, I just uh, stopped going to friends' houses. I stopped going anywhere if I could help it, especially alone. This whole thing just went on for years too. I was out of college and it was still happening too. For at least five years this went on and when I moved into my first place on my own, I, I was really scared. But I'd been seeing him less and less and I didn't want to live with my parents forever. But things went fine mostly and there would be weeks and then months in between Jeff's sightings. And then one day I... I saw him at the store and I left right away, not wanting him to see me. I didn't think he did and I made a few more stops before heading home and that's when I realized that I shouldn't let myself get complacent about this situation. I always, always made sure my doors and windows were locked when I wasn't home and even when I was sometimes, especially at night or if I just had a, a bad feeling or something. I'd been doing this since even before the Jeff situation began, so that was how I knew that there was just no fucking way that I left my door not only unlocked but slightly open. This just wasn't right, and I know I should have called the police, but I was feeling brazen. I think I was so tired of feeling like I just wasn't in control that I was trying to take the situation back into my own hands. So when I saw the door like it was, I, I readied my pepper spray and headed inside and then went to the kitchen and grabbed the knife and went around my place and checked every closet, checked under every bed, checked everywhere someone could be hiding, but luckily no one was there. That was a, a truly terrifying experience, I must say. I just kept expecting him to pop out of some hiding place or something, but he never did. Jeff wasn't there. I still couldn't sleep there that night though and I didn't want anyone to know so I got a hotel room for that night. For a long time I, I never told anyone about this incident because this was a, a clear line that Jeff had crossed. I had no proof that it was him but I knew that it was. I never called the police though because nothing was missing and there were no signs that anyone had broken in at all. But... I knew that he had been there. I could just feel it. It scares me to wonder what could have happened if I'd been home when he got there too. Unless you've been through something like this, you can't know what it's like to go through this sort of experience. How it just wrecks havoc on your psyche. How it shatters your trust and your sense of safety. But these are things you just don't really notice until they're ripped away from you. But there's this feeling of security that I've lost and... I, I don't think I'll ever get it back. It's been years since I've heard from Jeff, though I still live in the area. I have no idea if he's still watching me and most of the time I, I think he's moved on or just been jailed or something. But every once in a while I'll, I'll be parking at a lot or home alone and just get that feeling, the one that I've come to associate with him. Maybe it's just paranoia, a gift that... Jeff gave me that day he talked about me wearing a dress. I hope that's all it is, but sometimes I, I wonder. But the whole thing is just a, a part of my life now, and I try not to talk about it much, but everyone in my life knows about it. It's like the elephant in the room. I've changed a lot since then. I've got uh, anxiety issues now, and I'm extremely private. I'm not sure if it's all because of this but I know it's at least a factor. I'm still cautious and I still don't like to go out alone after dark 
I still lock my doors and windows whether or not it's night time, whether or not I'm home alone too, and I lock the bathroom door every time I shower, I, I check the locks at least three times before going to sleep, I, I still feel nervous if anything seems out of place at my apartment, or if I can't find something that should be in a particular place but isn't. I still carry pepper spray with me during the day, and I still take a knife to bed with me, all these years later. So I live by a freeway overpass. I can cross it and go to stores and it's about 10 or 11.30 p.m. at night and foggy and I wanted to grab some food. I decided to go somewhere where I needed to cross the overpass or walk almost a mile extra to get around. At the end of the overpass too is my city's largest cemetery. So I'm walking and I get to the halfway point of the bridge and... I see a, a male form in all black with a black hood on. It looks like the person was wearing a hoodie or something and I just had this oh shit feeling about this but continued walking anyway. Out of nowhere though I, I see this thing hop over the overpass. I screamed but hacked up phlegm instead in my asshole pocket and I seriously started to cry and ran to the spot. If this thing jumped it would have hit the grass median that divided the freeway. But when I got there, I saw nothing. Nothing at all. I stood there and looked and ran across the overpass and saw nothing on the other side too. No thud, no honking, no screeching of tires. I stood there sweating in 36 degree weather in a panic. And once I convinced myself that I had just hallucinated, I, I continued walking. I get my food and... I head back and I get to the end of the overpass to walk back and got hit with just complete dread. It was out of nowhere and I'm trying to remain calm and listen to my footsteps on the pavement. And then I heard it. Shuffling of a, another person's feet. I swing around and see nothing. I was the only person on the overpass. I continue walking and can hear footsteps on the wet pavement. I would stop and I would hear additional footsteps too. Well, that's it. I decided to walk in a jogging pace at this point. I'm a good 250 feet from home and I'm moving and I hear the footsteps behind me again. Honestly, I'm about to lose it and I'm at the edge of the overpass before it hits my street. There's a large puddle at the corner and I still can't see anything but I can hear it all. I stomp into the puddle and run across the street and then I heard a splash in the puddle and footsteps too. At this point, I'm near my house and I'm still turning around and constantly seeing nothing. I cross the road and still hear mine and another person's footsteps. I hit my driveway and yell, you're not welcome here and immediately the, the footsteps stopped. The worst part about all of this was me fumbling for my keys with my hands frozen and trying to unlock my door, thinking that I was about to get murdered or something. I have no clue what the fuck I encountered that night, but man, it was creepy. Okay, so uh, my first story is actually my friend's story. During the time that these things took place, we were all high school students. This is all happening in Florida, by the way. I already knew about uh, skinwalkers and the like, but when these things happened to me, I, I wasn't sure if it really was a skinwalker or something else. I've noticed that most of the people who tell me that they've experienced the same phenomenon live in the area that I do, and my friend is no exception. His name is Jay. Jay lives about 10 minutes away from me. She told me that in her bus that there's this one area they drive by to drop this kid off and she said that she doesn't know why but it just gives her the creeps. Well, she told me that one early morning, it was still dark outside, when they were driving in that area to pick him up, all the kids in the bus and the driver saw this weird ass deer running along the bus. It didn't run away from the bus, instead it ran beside it. She said that it looked weird as hell. You know all the usual shit about it, looking like some sort of humanoid deer because it just didn't look right. 
like its limbs were bent in an awkward way and she said its eyes were really freaky. Thing is, is that uh, my friend didn't know jack shit about skinwalkers or any of that mumbo jumbo so I got pretty big chills from that. I tried being reasonable though, cause, you know, maybe she just saw a regular deer and since it was dark she just got confused or something. Besides, it's Florida. I don't think we're supposed to get that type of stuff down here, right? However, Jay swore up and down that it wasn't like a normal deer. She said that they all saw it too and the bus driver even slowed down to get a better look at it because everyone was weirded out by it and it was basically pandemonium. After a while, it ran off and disappeared. Jay couldn't have made this up too because, like I said before, she doesn't really know anything about skinwalkers or the goat man or whatever it could have been. So, anyway, I get freaked out because, well, here I am knowing about fucking skinwalkers and the goat man and my friend is clueless thinking that she's just telling a regular story about some freaky ass deer demon. So, I asked her, do you know what skinwalkers are? She just looked at me and said, what's that? I googled it and showed her those depictions of skinwalkers and she goes, yeah, that's what I saw, except it had the head of a deer. She kept on saying it didn't look like an animal or a human and that after a while the kid from that bus stop just didn't come back. Now, a couple of years before she told me this story, I found myself one night sitting in my backyard like really early, uh, Maybe three in the morning or so because I was just thinking about personal things. I was just kind of chilling and enjoying the silence when all of a sudden I hear this really freaky ass echoing scream from really far away. The only way I can describe it is as if it was like a, a woman and a cat were trapped together inside of a bag and screaming like they were about to get murdered. I know mountain lions, foxes and owls are a thing and they make some weird ass mating calls but... I've looked that shit up trying to debunk myself, and it just didn't sound anything like that. Like, usually you'd be able to tell if it's an animal, right? It's just common sense. Like my friend said before, that shit just didn't sound animal or human. It just sounded really fucking unnatural and weird. Now, me being me, I was pretty unfazed at first. A little concerned, yeah. Like, at first it was really far away, and... I just thought it was a woman, and I actually thought that they might be killing people on the streets at 3am or something. The thing is, though, is that that shit travelled fast. It was freaky as fuck, and the closer it got, the more weird and unnatural it sounded, too. It only took me a couple of seconds to realise that that shit ain't a woman, and it ain't a cat either. Because while those things were going down, I was going through it in my head like, what the hell is that? This thing went from sounding like it was a, a couple of miles away to being in my fucking neighborhood and I swear like under five seconds. It was really fucking weird because one second it sounded so far away and then the next it sounded like it was in my street. To be honest, I, I almost shit myself and the second I stood up to leave, the scream just stopped. Like, it just dead ass stopped and... I'm really thinking at this point that it's in the front of my house or something. I walked as calmly as possible back inside and locked the doors and the scream was back to being far away again. It was weird as hell that night. I've also heard scraping and tapping on my window some nights, usually around the same time. I'd say uh, 2 to 4 o'clock in the morning time frame and... I've seen black figures that weren't affected by light outside of my house too. But to add details to these things so that you can get a feel for it, basically what happened is that I was doing a project for class and since I procrastinate like a pro, I'm up until 2am. I go to wash my hands from all the graphite and as the water is running I, I hear a scraping against one of the bathroom doors that leads to my backyard. Now, most of the door is made up of these uh, glass panels that kind of make everything look like a bunch of blurry goops if you try to see out of it. And for a split second, I, I thought I noticed something pointy and ash grey scraping against the window. It almost looked ghost-like, I'd say, and I turned off the water and wait a little bit and it comes back and scrapes against the window again. I'm trying not to freak out, but 
My hands are shaking at this point. It's stupid, but I actually whispered, what are you doing, while my voice trembled. It stopped, and I didn't hear anything except what sounded like someone walking by the window in my room every now and then. It continued that way for some nights, too, off and on, and I would be hearing footsteps by my window, and even a tap or two as well. Sometimes I, I just ignored them, and other times I, I looked out to see if someone was there, but there was never anyone. Another night, I'd been outside in my backyard again after having a rough day, and it was maybe three or so in the morning, and I'm sitting outside on the trampoline just relaxing. I suddenly notice, though, that it's absolutely dead quiet. Like, that kind of uneasy silence that almost feels like a vacuum. I get this feeling of dread, like I'm being watched, and I snap my head to the left and catch a glimpse of a, a humanoid black figure ducking under the other side of my fence immediately. I'm a little freaked out because I noticed this thing was pure black. Like, the streetlight nearby didn't even hit it at all. It almost looked cartoony if that makes any sense because it's like the laws of physics just didn't even apply to this thing. Now, I would think that I would be crazy if it wasn't for a lot of uh, kids in my school and around the area that I've told this to that have apparently all experienced the same shit. But one girl told me that she also heard tapping on her windows at night and even heard the screaming. It freaked me out because she explained it the same way that I did. She said it sounded like a woman or a cat, but not really like either. Another one of my friends who lives really close by told me that she saw dark figures in the woods and heard the screaming too. But pretty much everyone has heard this screaming and it sounded the same. And that's the thing, it's... It's in completely different time frames. And that's what's weird because everyone's voice sounds different. So how could she describe the same thing that I did? So after discussing it with a few friends, we all agreed from that point on that our town was just fucking haunted. But I don't know. I mean, if there's any animal that sounds like that, I want to know because that shit just didn't sound like anything that I've heard before so I'd like to be enlightened. The only person I've heard of who's seen anything remotely specific is my first friend from Art who went on that bus and apparently it's like really bad to talk about skinwalkers and even worse if you see them. Apparently it's like bad mojo or something. I know from what I've read too that these things are said to be able to travel really quickly so Thinking about that made it seem like what we experienced was a skinwalker. But to be honest, I, I really hope that there's a just a logical explanation that we aren't aware of. Also, uh, today I asked my co-worker who's also my friend in high school and lives nearby too. And he got all spooked and said that he's seen and heard the same things. He's very spiritual though and often has visions and whatnot and... He told me that he believes that they're doing dark magic in the woods because of a dream that he had about some hooded group sacrificing a woman and a cat or something. Which is kind of freaky because it also turns out that behind our local dog park there's a, a patch of woods with some uh, really shifty shit in there. I was shown this by an acquaintance during my freshman year who lives a couple of streets away. Down the path in the woods after some time of walking there's this huge cross that's just smack dab in the middle of nowhere. It's basically raw, crooked-ass wood just nailed together into a cross with a, a rope hanging from where you would put your hands if you were getting crucified or something. It's huge too, and whenever I decide to check it out, I, I always feel uneasy. Like this feeling that if I stay for too long, something bad will happen. It doesn't look like a grave or anything, to be honest, but who knows? Anyway, uh... He says that I'm not the first person that he knows who's told me about experiences like this, and he's also had uh, his own experiences with this humanoid figure. He says that he saw one and it turned and looked at him directly in the eyes, if it immediately knew what he was looking at. And so, uh, but basically, we, we just don't fuck with shit in the woods anymore. Okay, so... For starters, I'm, I'm 22 and I moved into this very nice apartment about four months ago. 
During the first three months there, there was nothing even remotely strange happening that I can recall. Not a noise in the night, or anything mysteriously falling, or anything like that, which makes these encounters just even weirder for me for some reason. Also, I, I should add that I have never had any paranormal encounters or even slight interest in the paranormal until now. So, about two weeks ago is where everything started to get really bizarre. And that's really the only word that I can use to describe what's been happening to me. Two weeks ago, I was finishing up a movie and I remember the time being 1am on the dot and I turned out all the lights and went to the bathroom like I have every night since I moved in and... When I flicked on the light, I, I saw a man flash before my eyes, who had what looked like a, a top hat on, but it wasn't quite a top hat. I don't know what to call it, but he had some kind of black on his face and the rest was white. Not pale, but completely white. His hands were too, and he had what looked like a, an old trench coat type of deal on. I don't remember anything else, really, and... When I flicked on the light, he was there for about a quarter of a second, and he looked very, very malevolent, and it wasn't just the fact that I had uh, just seen a scary man in my bathroom at 1am that got me. When I looked into his eyes, I, I really felt this evilness that I just can't really describe, which is kind of why I, I guess I'm sharing this here in the first place, because I'm, uh, I'm scared of it. I screamed at the top of my lungs, obviously, and I can honestly say that I've never done that before. I ran and flicked on my living room light and slept on the couch that night with the TV on. The next day, I, I tried to make myself believe that it was just a hallucination, but it was just so extremely vivid. It wasn't like a ghost or anything, it was straight up what looked like a physical body just standing in my bathroom. The day after the sighting, I was working on my computer too until I heard what sounded like one of my glass cups just breaking in the kitchen. It scared the shit out of me too because it was pretty loud and I went to go and check it out. And I was pretty fearful to do so because I knew it might have something to do with what I saw the day before. I got into the kitchen and I saw a framed photo laying face down with glass pieces around it. This was one of my favorite things that I owned too. One of my dear friends gave it to me a week before she left for Stockholm. It was just a picture of us in front of the Colosseum. We both love everything about Italy, and I know it's not much, but it was very special to me and holds a place in my heart. So when I saw it on the ground, I honestly wasn't even scared. I was just sad as fuck. The picture itself was ripped down the middle too, literally almost splitting the two of us in the picture. I was, uh... I was angry because I remember yelling fuck you because I know it must have done it because I put that picture up the day I moved in. Over the next week, nothing happened except for one night. I was sleeping and I woke up and I was terrified honestly because I haven't woke up in the middle of the night since I was pretty much a kid. I'm a great sleeper. So I, I looked around my room and nothing was there. But... About 15 seconds after, I, I heard what sounded like something come from my living room and fade out into my kitchen. It was a, a really weird sound, but it was kind of like sprinting. I didn't say a word, and I laid in bed trying not to move the blankets to make a noise. I can honestly say that I was more scared than when I was in the bathroom. My heart must have been beating 160 beats a minute. I stayed up for the next hour and a half too until I just accidentally fell asleep. This was dumb of me I know because it could have been an actual robber or something and I just stayed in bed but I, I can't even tell you how terrified I was in that moment. Everything was intact in my apartment the next day too. The night after that I, I slept on my couch and I woke up to a noise which I uh... I could not explain to you if you had a gun to my head. It sounded just absolutely nauseating. It sounded like it was coming from my bedroom, but I couldn't really tell. All my lights were on, so I was definitely less scared, but I sat up because I knew that I wouldn't be able to sleep after that. When I sat up, I, I noticed that there was a, a minuscule amount of blood on my pants. 
pulled down my pants to see what it was from and there were scratch marks that had three streaks. I was bleeding, uh, not a lot, but it was definitely fresh. I was freaked out, obviously, because I definitely did not have those marks the day before. I went to the kitchen to clean myself up, not even looking in the bathroom's direction on my way there. And ever since then, every so often, I, I was hearing that same sound that I heard before. But however I describe the noise, it's not going to do it justice of just how truly unsettling it was. But it was almost like a, a little melody in a high-pitched raspy man's voice. I really can't afford to move right now, but this thing is obviously malicious. This is just really odd, so I don't expect straight up help from any of you guys, but rather I, I just hope you can tell me what you would do in my situation. Update 1 So, thanks to everybody who's been offering me advice, uh, it really makes me feel a lot better uh, to have access to people with such knowledge of the paranormal. I've been listening to the audio from last night and I didn't hear anything at all and I'll update you guys if uh, anything happens. Update 2. Hey guys, uh, my coat rack just pretty much flew across the room. I'm, uh, I'm getting kind of scared as this seems to be uh, progressing badly. Should I use some sage or something? I'm getting a bit desperate. Uh, I heard sage can sometimes uh, make things worse though. I'm also going to try and record audio tonight again. Uh, I'll update you guys. Update 3. So the bathroom door just slammed hard and I heard things hitting the wall and when I worked up the courage to finally open the door, my medicine cabinet was wide open and everything was just thrown into the bathtub. This is getting too real for me and I just can't really handle this anymore. People are saying not to show out fear but to be honest with you, I'm scared all day every day, just waiting for the next thing to happen now. I, uh, I might ask to stay out of friends for a bit but... What's that going to do? Eventually I have to come back to my apartment. I need to get rid of whatever this is. Pronto. Update 4. Hey, I was laying on my couch and I put my glass of water down next to me on the floor and when I went to go and reach it to get it, it was just completely gone. And I still haven't found it. Like, I only took three sips of it and put it down. I mean, where could it have gone? 